Uh, good evening. Today is Monday, April 15th, 2024. Thank you for those of us who have joined us in Contois Auditorium and online for our Burlington City Council meeting. Uh, the time is now 6.02 p.m. Uh, I will just note for the record that, that at the moment we are absent Councillor Bergman uh, and um, Councillor Grant. I am anticipating Councillor Grant will join us. Uh, I know Councillor Bergman will be absent this evening. The first item on our agenda is item 1.1, a motion to adopt our agenda. Uh, do I have a motion along those lines? So moved by Councillor Carpenter. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor, let me make sure I get it. New Beezer, New Beezer, New Beezer, okay. I thought so, thank you. Uh, second by uh, Councillor New Beezer. Is there any discussion on the agenda? All in favor of adopting our agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? It's adopted unanimously. We uh, now turn to uh, item two on our agenda, um, a communication from Eric Ramakrishnan, Assistant City Attorney, uh, Brian Pine, CEDO Director, Catherine Shad, CAO, and Scott Barker, INT Director, regarding discussion of real estate negotiations regarding potential sale of city property at 200 Church Street. Um, I believe uh, Mayor, do we, do we have Director Pine on? Oh, he's there. You're behind <laughs> Councillor Newbazer. Um, so, Director Pine, uh, you and anyone else, um, I think we had discussed perhaps uh, a, a public facing uh, portion of the presentation on this item, um, and then we anticipate we will need to move into executive session on this uh, following uh, your presentation, uh, but we'll turn to you first. Thank you. For the record, it's, I'm Brian Pine, the Director of the Community and Economic Development Office, and with me is? Eric Ramakrishnan, Assistant City Attorney. Okay. So I wanted to present, uh, provide some information that I think um, will lay the foundation for the conversation about the p potential sale of 200 Church Street. The city acquired the property uh, in 2005 to provide both office space and a location. I apologize, Director Pine. Is the microphone on? Because if it is, it doesn't sound like it's amplifying in the room. It is not only on, but it's stuck. Yeah, but the, the light is on, so. That's Are better. You, yeah, great. I got to get really close, fine. All right, so it was, it was acquired by the city in 2005 to provide office space and uh, a location for what was then the nascent Burlington Telecom's op, uh, Network Operations Center. Um, the city retained ownership when the assets of Burlington Telecom were transferred in 2014 to a holding company that was created essentially to allow the city sufficient time to resolve the legal and financial issues involving Burlington Telecom. Two thirds of this building, it's about, it's 15,000 square feet, roughly 5,000 on each floor. Um, one floor is often referred to as a basement, um, uh, but two-thirds of the building is leased by the city to Burlington Telecom for their offices and their network operation center. Monthly lease payment is plus or minus $10,000 for that space. Um, total annual operating expenses, so that's just operating. It doesn't include any funds uh, set aside for what we call replacement reserves or capital improvements. Uh, is about $65,000 um, to operate the building. So it gives you some idea of <clears throat> just order of magnitude what uh, the economics of this piece of real estate uh, involved for the city. We have the Human Resources Department uh, in that space, uh, payroll, which I guess is not really part of Human Resources, but it's really part of clerk treasurers, I think. Oh, okay, so it's part of HR, thank you, okay. So really HR with its payroll function, as well as the Community Justice Center um, not all of their staff can fit there. So there's 80% of the staff is there and the rest are uh, in the courthouse and in Burlington Police Department's building. Uh, the plan is to relocate the Community Justice Center at the end of 2025 to a new building being created by Champlain Housing Trust where the VFW um, has been for the last 50 years, roughly. Um, 
the city will focus to uh, on finding pr appropriate space to relocate the HR payroll functions uh, because at the end of 2025 um, with CJC leaving there will be a, a whole wing of the building that will be empty and it, it seemed like a good opportunity to consolidate some of our um, our, our space that we um, occupy as a city some of sort of our footprint so fast forward to Shores as the company that uh, owns Burlington Telecom. They own and operate six broadband, I refer to them as subsidiaries, they call them properties and across six different states. Burlington is one of those. Um, and their business model really is, as with all I think broadband companies, is to own the building from which they are operating rather than to lease it. Uh, they make huge investments in the infrastructure and their buildings and that's just a um, part of the, the business model for uh, those who are in this market segment. Um, the uh, asset purchase agreement that you all um, uh, had access to uh, accomplished a, um, a goal which is that of Burlington Telecom and of the city was to give the city time by holding on to this property but giving BT certainty that, that they would be uh, able to buy the property either through a right of first refusal or through an option, a purchase option and Eric can definitely tell you more about the legal nuances of those, but think of the right of first refusal is your neighbor says to you, I'll give your right of first refusal. When I, if I ever put the property on the market, you can, you can be the first one who gets to make an offer. Um, and the option is um, different. You give someone an option, you're saying uh, you can actually buy this property under certain terms and conditions. Uh, whether or not I put it on the market, I'm basically agreeing to sell it to you. Um, I think that's okay summary without getting that's a perfectly good summary, actually. <laughs> okay. um, so the, the current lease term for 200 Church, uh, and I'll take full responsibility for mistakenly thinking that it was uh, one of what are called three renewal terms. It's actually the first initial term is the first five-year period that really just ended um, in March. So that's, the, that's that first five-year lease period um, that we're now in the first renewal term and so that was a misreading um, on my part, and uh, no one else caught it, so that mistake went into the first document, but um, City Attorney Ramakrishnan sent out a clarification on that today, so I think we covered that one. Um, I think two points I just want to highlight in the asset purchase agreement, I think I already did on one of them, that is the right of first refusal, and the option agreement, um, uh, the option portion of that agreement, essentially what it means is the city, although it May appeal, it may appear to be advantageous maybe to sit on it, hoping that it will grow and increase in value. It still ultimately will be sold, and, and BT is the, is the most, I think, r likely scenario, the most likely buyer under the agreement that we have uh, currently that's um, it's both in place and, and certainly enforceable. Um, we, as a city, face major systems in the building that are beyond their useful life, and I got some detail that I actually didn't have this detail before, so this is information that is um, uh, much more precise on how uh, end of useful life they are. Um, the HVAC system consists of three different air handling units and they are uh, anywhere from 13 to eight years beyond useful life, beyond their useful life, which means that when they go down, the parts that you need to repair them uh, are increasingly harder and harder to get and those air handling units do the ventilation, they do the heat, they do the air conditioning. Um, so it's really a situation where we don't have an option uh, ahead of us other than to invest the substantial capital funds into uh, upgrading that HVAC system. And I think I included an estimate, uh, and it could be as, as much as 1.2 million to do that. Uh, on the low end, um, the facility staff estimates it at 850, but thinks it's probably somewhere closer to the 1.2. Um, there's also a rubber membrane roof that has been patched and repaired and should make it through this um, season or this summer, but they think that it will probably also need to be um, replaced. It is at the end of its useful life. Um, unfortunately, I think one of the things the city hasn't done well for quite a long time is, is setting aside funds for replacing major capital improvements on buildings, and this is no exception with 200 church and so there's not only there are no reserve funds available for it it's also I think worth noting that um, 
We spend about two, between two and three million a year uh, total citywide on streets and sidewalks. So that means literally repairing streets and sidewalks. And then about another between one and a half and two million for city buildings and, and turning our fleet over. So when you think of the fire trucks and greening the fleet and turning over to electric vehicles, that's all in that number there. And that's a very limited amount. And we're also limited by the fact that um, our sustainable infrastructure bond is, is fully committed and fully basically obligated. Uh, and we do, of course, have our high school bond, which puts us in a tough place to borrow. So we're, we're really looking at the, the needs here as um, both the capital costs that we can avoid as well as the future use of this building for, um, you know, for the purposes of Burlington Telecom, which was uh, envisioned when the transaction occurred. And um, we think that those reasons are uh, why we're here tonight to talk to you. Thank you, Director Pine. Greatly appreciate you providing that public-facing portion, portion of the presentation, um, as is standard practice in order for us to discuss some of the more confidential terms around a proposed real estate transaction. We will need to move into executive session uh, to confirm for the uh, sake of the public there will be no action taken on this item tonight. Um, but before a motion on executive session, are there uh, any counselors who have any comments or questions focused on the public-facing por portion of this presentation? Councillor Grant, Councillor Broderick, and Councillor Newbezer. Thank you. So um, I was one who was confused by some of the, the language, so I understand the issues with uh, the repairs that are needed to the building, but I, I guess I want to be clear as to what is, is in this agreement. If we choose to keep the building, we could keep the building. We don't have to sell the building. That is or true. is there that something is in the until, green? Until 20, I had, we had the dates wrong, so I'll okay. just say it wasn't 2029 is what we had in the original document. It's 2034 is when their exclusive unilateral option, meaning they get to buy the building in 2034. Yeah, they, they, have, they have a whole period, a whole five-year period, but it starts in 2034. Okay, so at some point, whether we want to or not, we have to sell them the building. If they exercise the option, they don't, they, they, it's their option to exercise. So if they want the building, we have to sell the building. Right. Exactly. Thank you. Councilor Broderick. So looking at the, um, the, the issue, specifically the HVAC issue, which you um, have appraised of 850,000 to 1.2 million, where is that figure coming from? It's coming from our facility staff, the city staff, based on their conversations and their knowledge of replacing similar size systems. So it's really, it's, that's why it's a range. That's why the number is such a big range. But their costs have gone up significantly since they started looking at this. So they're a little bit probably leaning on the high side because of where costs are now to get projects done. Has the city looked at alternative options in terms of uh, um, federal programs, state programs, et cetera, to replace the HVAC in a hopefully cheaper way than replacing the older technology that we have? No, there's probably, um, I, I think that what happens with city facilities is if we're gonna hold on, for instance, to this building, there's a desire to find any way you can perhaps to to make upgrades like that with a building that has a future where you're certain that another entity has got an interest in buying it. There's sort of a trade-off there as far as whether you're going to make that big public investment for the eventual private entity that has the option to buy it. So I think there's, I think there's just a trade-off to make there. And we, we didn't spend too much time trying to find a more creative way to finance the, the infrastructure or the capital improvement. Um, largely because there's other pressing city capital needs that you know seem to rise to a higher level. Yeah, I, I understand that. I'm just just looking at the memo when being the, the chief reason um, for wanting to make the sale now is the substantial capital investment. I'm just wondering that if looking for a cheaper option, putting in that time and research if possible, would 
make not giving it away now a more desirable option and now that we know that we're not waiting until 2029 we're actually waiting until 2034 for that mandatory sell if they so choose to um, I personally believe that looking into making it cheaper um, those those upgrades and potentially raising the appraisal value of the property um, for that f potential sale. Um, it's just something that I've been thinking about since I saw your memo. Thank you. Councilor Newbezer. Um, <clears throat> I have a point of information and then questions, depending on the answer. Are we gonna be able to speak to this uh, post-executive session? Probably not. Okay, um, I have a few questions then, <laughs> if that's all right. Um, so for the HVAC system, is it the whole system, including ductwork, that needs to get replaced on all three floors? I'm not a building science person necessarily, although I did work for five years for Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, so I know a little bit about it. I wouldn't want to pretend that I know what that scope of work entails, so I don't know if, the, if it involves replacing the ductwork or if it's primarily the air handling units and the distribution system and pumps to ensure that it's circulating to the whole building and you know really as a result of COVID um, indoor air quality has taken on a whole new level of importance so there's I think there's a need to upgrade what's there in terms of how much air is moved to for safe occupancy that I do know yeah no thank you um, the follow up yeah did was the, were, the, were there estimates done if we did hold on to this building until the deadline 2034, which I assume they're gonna wanna buy it then if they wanna buy it now. Um, what does the increase in value look like? Like has that been thought through just even if it's back of the back of the napkin now? No, I think it's it's always challenging, especially with a commercial, you know, income property. There's so many different variables, it's really super challenging to do that with a commercial property of this type. Um, I'll just give an example with office space. You know, there was a big demand pre-COVID and now office space has less value. It's a less desirable thing to, to own office space. So um, we don't know where that's gonna go in 10 years. I would not venture to guess. My crystal ball looks really fuzzy. <laughs> no, that's fair. Um, one final question, uh, or maybe just a comment. Um, I'm just very, I'm open to being convinced in executive session, would love to hear more. Um, I'm very hesitant to be selling off uh, public assets in principle, um, and given the amount of money coming from the federal government for efficiency upgrades, for infrastructure, IRA funds, et cetera, um, if we haven't sort of exhausted all options um, and we haven't done, I don't know, it, ju it just seems like a pretty big give uh, in potential gain down the road. Um, so I guess that's where I'm at now, but we'll see what other info there is. I would note that when the federal government puts out requests for proposals, they're really looking for buildings like this, like schools, true public buildings that actually serve a main public purpose. When you have a building where two thirds of the square footage is used by a private entity, they're not, it's not super competitive. So I can tell you from a little experience writing some pretty big grants in my life that they're not gonna, the federal government's not gonna look at a building that is two thirds commercial activity as a, investment opportunity for federal funds. And I just wanted to add, as the person who is helping to oversee our grants team, um, this is something that I have asked them to prioritize because we know that we are running low on bond money and that we have a lot of deferred maintenance. And it is something that, as Brian mentions, we have not been very successful in finding grants for municipal buildings for this kind of work full stop. And it's even more difficult because we ha are sharing this building with BT. So um, I think that has certainly factored into the calculus here that we could always keep looking, but really over the past two years that we've had the grants team, that is something that is always on their list as a top priority and we haven't found any grants to apply to at this point. Just one more quick point if that's right. Um, sure. Just that 
uh, if we could tie improvements to climate and energy in some way, um, a lot of those federal funds do uh, can be accessed for commercial buildings. Um, just throwing that out there, though. Thank you, Councilor Newbezer. So I am uh, I'm mindful of time. We had set aside um, 30 minutes for this, which is why I indicate that I, I doubt we will have an opportunity for further comment after executive session. Um, but are, are there any other councillors with questions or comments for, for this portion of the discussion or the mayor's office? Councillor Kane. Thanks. So when did we become aware of the urgent need to replace the HVAC system? I don't work in the facilities department, so I have to ask the facilities folks. I don't know. I'm not sure. Thanks. <clears throat> and do you guys have a sense, or have you have you thought about, um, like, have you considered what the return on investment might be in making the upgrades, the capital improvements in the building? Um, having done energy efficiency financing, I can tell you that owning a building of this type in order to to if you're looking at a straight financial payback, um, the term of ownership would need to be quite a bit longer than what remains in this 10-year lease period that we have. Yeah, it's the okay. payback from, a, from an investment standpoint as far as return on investment, it goes out pretty far on an, invest, on an improvement like this. Thanks, and just to be clear, it sounds like you guys have not considered replacing the HVAC system with, with heat pumps or a greener alternative system? Uh, I'd have to check with Kim on that. I think right now um, the price, that, I mean, the, the, the ballpark price that they have is whether we go with a, I mean, with a ducted system, you have the advantage of being able to do, you know, a whole building heat pump system. Um, but that's still in the ballpark number that, you know, I checked with her at least a couple months ago and she said it was still going to be, you know, in that ballpark as far as capital requirements. So you think it would cost at least $850,000 to install a heat pump for the building? She thought so as well because in order to make sure that that is producing, you need to also address building envelope issues and you need to make some upgrades to the building envelope as well. So, yeah. Thanks. And while you say your crystal ball is murky and you're not sure what will happen to commercial real estate in the next decade, um, I think the fact that the purchaser, the, the, the party with the option in a decade to purchase would like to move forward now, I think speaks volumes. Um, you referenced that commercial real estate prices are down as a result of COVID. It, it would seemed to me like we would be selling at the low point. Our downtown also has um, a lot of upcoming development, a lot of development that has been stalled for a long time, as, as you're well aware, as CETO you know, touches a lot of these projects. Um, so I'm having a lot of trouble yeah, wrapping my head around why we would sell now unless the purchaser was willing to pay a price significantly above current market value. And just to clarify, we, we approached them. They didn't, it wasn't their idea. We were facing this challenge, so we approached them. And they didn't Understood. Come to us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, just before moving further, I would just, I would note to the folks here from Town Meeting TV that I'm, I'm receiving some feedback from folks online that our video and audio feed is not uh, publicly available. Um, so if there's a way to try to correct that. And uh, while we're doing that, Director Pine, I know we've had a pretty uh, good discussion here now in open session to confirm, do you, do you feel there's still a need for us to move into executive session to discuss some of the more confidential terms of the proposed transaction? I think it'd be helpful. I think we have, uh, you know, we have certain aspects of the, of the proposed agreement that we haven't felt we could discuss in public, so we'd like to be able to do that with you. Okay. Great. It will become a public document if you all decide to proceed, obviously. So. Absolutely. Uh, any further comments, questions from the council? All right. If there is a motion to uh, move into executive session, I would turn to Councillor Carpenter. And because this is involving a real estate transaction, I'll note that uh, we, are, we only require one motion here.
I would move that the council enter into executive session. I would move that the council enter into executive session to discuss real estate negotiations in conjunction with 200 Church Street pursuant to 1 VSA 313A2 to include the mayor, chief of staff, legal counsel, the CEDO director, chief administrative officer, and the chief innovation officer. Motion by Councillor Carpenter. Is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Councillor Shannon. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All in favor of Councillor Carpenter's motion to move into executive session, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are now in executive session. Uh, the council will go to the Busher conference room. Uh, I would anticipate that we will hopefully return in, in no more than 15 minutes and re resume with our agenda at 6.45 p.m. and, and hopefully uh, work out some of the tech issues in the interim. Thank you. So the, uh, the, the time is 7.03 p.m. and uh, the council just exited executive session. Uh, we'll ask for order and contours, please. Thank you. Um, to folks attending online, uh, my understanding is that when we commenced our meeting as a council that perhaps we did not have uh, video and audio at that point in time. The council has spent the vast majority of the past hour uh, in executive session on the potential sale uh, of, of city property. Um, so you didn't miss much in short. Um, but I believe that it is now working, um, and it is now 7.04 p.m. Um, we did have a uh, legislative update as item three uh, on our agenda scheduled before public forum, and thank you to Mr. Fian for your patience. Uh, but uh, we do need to turn to public forum now uh, at a time certain. Um, we uh, would like to note that we do have a process for public forum. And I speak for the full council that we share a strong commitment to an orderly process and one that honors all voices and respectful discourse. We will turn first to uh, folks who are Burlington residents uh, in person here in Contoy's Auditorium. We would then turn online to Burlington residents. We would then turn back uh, to folks in person uh, who are non-Burlington residents and then back online. Uh, to wrap up public forum. At this point in time, we have uh, 15 individuals who have signed up uh, for public forum and are Burlington residents here in person. As I call your name, we would ask that you please come up to the table here. Uh, please make sure that the microphone is turned on and the green light is illuminated. I'm told that you also need to get very close to the microphone uh, in order for folks to hear you on these devices, so please do that. Um, as folks come forward for public forum, I, I would ask that you please direct your comments to the chair. Uh, please be respectful. Uh, please do not engage in any personal attacks. Uh, with that, we will start public forum. Um, the first individual uh, signed up as a Burlington resident is Steve Goodkind, to be followed by Nick Persampieri. Steve? Oh, and I will remind folks that, that we are maintaining the, the, the two-minute limit on public forum, and the timer is over there. Thank you, Lori. I think you need to hit the microphone, make sure that green light is on, and then get very close to it. Now, that, that's, that's the different green light. You need, on the microphone base itself, you need to make sure that you hit the button and that the green light is on. Hit the push button, I got and it. then... Okay. Thank you, President Trevers. Um, tonight, BD is going to be presenting an update on their zero energy plan. I think it's part of your reports on the battle against climate change. There were limited materials provided before the meeting, but from what I could tell, it does appear that there's one very critical element, one very critical requirement lacking from their report. As several counselors might remember, as part of the resolution that approved the steam pipe to the hospital, there was a requirement that BED begin to include CO2 emissions as measured at the stack of McNeil in their climate change reports and their efforts to um, deal with climate change in our city. I don't see anything in this information provided tonight that has any inkling of that. I think it's imperative that the council tell BED they have to do this and basically send their report back for 
the proper revisions. This was a requirement put in a previous city council resolution. It's pretty important, and it really sets the stage for what Burlington is going to actually do. Because if we're not going to look at stack emissions from McNeil, we're really not looking at anything, and the zero report isn't even worth reading. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Goodkind. Uh, we next have Nick Persampieri to be followed by Lena Greenberg. Is, I don't see the clock working. Do I need to turn it on? Or? The clock will be running here. You just need to make sure the microphone light is lit up green. And, and if you could get as close as possible to the microphone, that'd be great. Thank you. Congratulations to the new counselors and the new chair. I'm Nick Persampieri. I'm a Ward 3 resident. Burlington needs a new climate policy, and it needs to transfer, transfer responsibility for development of climate policy away from Burlington Electric, the operator of the largest source of greenhouse gases in the state. It needs to transfer responsibility for development of climate policy to a city official or department independent of Burlington Electric. The city's main policy, the net zero energy roadmap, defines net zero as reducing and eliminating fossil fuel use from the heating and ground transportation sectors. This policy is flawed in two fundamentally different ways. First, it focuses on reducing fossil fuel use rather than reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The rest of the world defines net zero in terms of dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. The concept means reducing emissions so that they're in balance with uptake of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, Secondly, the policy is flawed because it emits entire sectors. It focuses only on the heating and ground transportation sectors, ignores the electric generation sector and the airport. We need to end this uh, false distinction between fossil fuels and renewables. Some of the renewables that are promoted by city policy emit large quantities of greenhouse gases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Uh, next up, we have Lena Greenberg to be followed by Dave Marr. Hey, everyone. Um, council terms are short. They're very short in this city. Even the mayoral term is quite short in our city. Um, the UN climate chief says we have two years to act on drastic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, that means it is your job. If you aren't sure where to start, I can assure you that there is a room full and more than that, a city full of people who are you know, on the edge of our seats waiting to help you. Um, we are here, we have lots of ideas, we will write resolutions and email them to you, maybe we already have. Um, There's so many things we can do right now, and there are so many things that will take longer term planning, but we don't have time to waste on saying, oh, let's study it, or oh, let's put it in the hands of someone who is never gonna approve it, or oh, it's simply too challenging to address the defining issue of our decade and of the rest of our lives and our children's lives. So, welcome to this new term. Thank you for your service. Please call on the community of people who are here to help and write some good climate policy that's gonna put Burlington back in the good graces of greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Uh, next we have Dave Marr to be followed by Greg Hancock. Good evening. My name is Dave Marr. I live in the New North End. I'm gonna tell a story about my older brother, Howard. He had a hard time growing up. He was a smart guy. He got 100 on his New York State chemistry regents but he never did well in school. He underachieved. He didn't put much effort into it. He went into college, but dropped out after the first semester. And he came home and just sat around the house. He didn't get a job, didn't do much for chores, didn't do much for, of anything. So after over a year, my father said to him, Howard, you gotta get out of here. I'll give you a bus ticket and 50 bucks to get you started, but you need to get out of here. So he bought a bus ticket to White Plains and brought the $50 with him. 
and he checked into the YMCA on Mamaroneck Avenue. After the $50 ran out, he got a job at the deli next to the YMCA. That was the first job he had ever had in his life, and the first time he had any money in his pockets. A year later, he said that was the best thing that ever happened to him. So there's two lessons from this. One is sometimes people need a push. Not a helping hand, not a handout, but a push to get on their feet, to get working, and to live independently. And second, we could use housing like the YMCA used to provide. Simple, clean, and affordable to somebody making minimum wage. So I hope you'll keep these two lessons in mind as you develop plans to address homelessness in Burlington. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next we have Greg Hancock to be followed by Romeo Herman. Uh, good evening and thank you. Um, do I need to push a button? I think the microphone should be on if you could just speak very closely to the microphone. If, if you see a green light lit up on the base of the microphone, you're good. Uh, you may have just turned it off, um, I'm hearing. Okay, is this good? You, no, you're my name good. Is Greg Hancock. My family, my wife, and my children have lived in Burlington for more than 20 years. I want to welcome the new mayor, Emma, and our new uh, councilors who are here for their first session tonight. Uh, I know some of you, good to see you. Um, I wanna thank you all for your willingness and dedication to serving the many needs that we have of this great city. Uh, my comments tonight um, pertain to the BED presentation that you're gonna soon hear and hear about in the, uh, the, uh, the roadmap. Um, BED and especially McNeil Generating Station have been a focus of my and many of our concerned citizens for several years now. There's much to parse and discuss, but in my limited two minutes, or now 114, I want to talk about the negative health effects and emissions beyond greenhouse gases, mostly CO2, which, which have already been well covered by other, on other occasions, and you'll hear about tonight from some other speakers. We all know that the plant has, is the largest station emitter of greenhouse gases in the state of Vermont, with more, <coughs> with more than 400,000 tons annually emitted. Um, what about the other gases that uh, are released, which aren't in the net zero energy roadmap or published very readily? Well, the recent US EPA data about McNeil plant shows that there's 149 tons annually of nitrous uh, oxides, um, 585 tons of carbon monoxide, which reduces oxygen to the brain and, ir and the heart, irritates mm -hmm. lungs and heart, and um, the VOCs are vol uh, volatile organic compounds like benzene and formaldehyde, which irritates eyes, nose, throats, and increases the risk of cancer. 16 tons annually come out of that stack. And on and on, it sort of reads like a, uh, like a Tom Lear uh, song about the elements. So I, I just wanted to bring that up, and inconvenient facts are written off sometimes, ignored, but it's time to pay attention and act now. Thank you. Uh, next up is Romeo Herman. Uh, to be followed by Ashley Adams. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, good afternoon, Mr. President, Mayor, City Councilors, City Administrative Team, City Staff, fellow Burlingtonians, residents. I'm here to support item 9.5. The Burlington Fire Department Community Response Team has emerged as an indispensable asset in the city, addressing the opioid crisis within our city. With a proven track record of success, extending financial support for the continuation of this vital service is not just prudent, but essential. By utilizing the remaining opioid settlement funds, the fire department can sustain community response team beyond the initial six-month pilot phase, ensuring ongoing assistance to those affected by the opioid crisis. Investing in the CRT, not just now, but long-term, is not merely a matter of financial support, but a commitment to the well-being of our city and safety. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Ashley Adams to be followed by Nolan Rogers.
evening. Congratulations and welcome to the new session. Uh, my name is Ashley Adams. I'm a Burlington resident, a mom, a business owner. And as I frequently point out, our window of opportunity to salvage a ha habitable climate sufficiently biodiverse to support human life is quickly slamming shut. And that's why I'm here to speak about the Net Zero Roadmap, a document that masquerades as a climate action plan while ignoring 80% of Burlington's emissions. The roadmap boasts that Burlington gets 100% of power from renewable generation, yet climate scientists tell us we need to switch to non-combustion sources of power, not more renewables. The term renewable has become a greenwashing term that allows heavy polluters like Burlington Electric to continue to run the McNeil Generating Plant, the largest stationary source of greenhouse gas pollution in the state of Vermont, and call it climate neutral. Many people in our community have spent countless hours trying to educate decision makers. They're lawyers, ecologists, policy experts, and other well-informed people who have attempted to connect those in power with the latest science and sound policy, even working to bring two prominent client climate scientists here last June for the McNeil Biomass Symposium. If you did not attend, I urge you to watch the recording. The climate scientists made it clear that the McNeil plant must shut down, just as climate scientists around the world have been urging for these types of plants. Burning wood emits more carbon pollution than all fossil fuels, even coal. In fact, if we were to burn fossil fuels, we would allow trees to continue to grow old and sequester and store ever more carbon, support biodiversity, mitigate floods, and clean our water and air. They would continue, in the words of Dr. Bill Muma, as, quote, essential organs of a living planet of Earth's operating system. Discussions about shutting down the plant and canceling the $42 million steam pipe to the hospital must start today. Furthermore, our climate policy needs to be removed from the electric utility, where the extreme conflict of interest will continue to undermine real action on climate. Burlington deserves a credible climate action plan. No utility should be crafting climate policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Nolan Rogers to be followed by Jane McDougall. Uh, hi, Council. My name is Nolan Rogers. I'm a Ward 3 resident of Burlington. Um, I'm here also to just mention a few things about the BED Net Zero Energy Roadmap. Um, the main thing is that, uh, well, first I want to acknowledge that uh, I'm kind of grateful that we have um, energy utility um, partially operated by the city, and I think they're doing a, a, a good job, generally speaking, being a relatively clean utility compared to some other um, places in the United States. But that being said, um, I would love to see a little bit more transparency, or rather a lot more transparency, in the documentation that goes along with stuff like this. Obviously, we commissioned a report to talk about uh, what we can do to get down to net zero. Um, and that report and the updates aren't super clear. I mean, I, I feel like as a resident that BED is kind of holding the information a little close to the chest. Uh, it's not really, uh, the whole report or the updates rather aren't um, easily accessible on the website. And the presentation that you're gonna see tonight has uh, a few of the graphs that are presented uh, as the updates. Um, and so I guess uh, really clearly, I would love to see, first of all, if, you, if the city council could encourage BED or just to publish the report and the updates yearly from the company that it's commissioned from, um, on the BED or city council website, that would be great. So we can just look at the report as citizens. Um, and then also I would love to see um, how many gas hookups are deleted or gotten rid of every year in Burlington from uh, a given household. I think that really uh, goes to show how much we're moving away from fossil fuels. Um, and that's kind of a direct, um, a, a direct measure of how much we can get away rather than um, some not super strong um, indicators of, of reduction that we're going to see tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Jane McDougall to be followed by Jack Hansen. Hey, my name is Shay McDougall, and what I want to talk about tonight is the Mono Auditorium. I've been there, and I want to say that the auditorium needs a new mic, 
new heating system, and uh, because I've been in there year 2016, it was like an ice box. We had to wear coats in there, and the heat didn't work. So when are you going to get that building fixed? It was built in World War II. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Jack Hansen to be followed by Ryan Hagen. Hey everyone, thanks for your service. Um, I know most of you, but not all. My name's Jack Hansen. I previously served on the city council from 2019 to 2022. Um, I'm here to talk as well about the net zero energy roadmap. I agree with previous speakers. I think the framework and the roadmap itself to begin with doesn't go far enough in terms of what we need to do to eliminate emissions in Burlington. But even within the roadmap, I think we should all be concerned at where we're at versus where we said we would be. And I was on the council when we originally adopted this. Um, we declared that this was a climate emergency, that we needed to do everything in our power to eliminate emissions by 2030. Here we are almost about halfway into that. Um, and we've only reduced emissions by 18%. So. I mean, I think it, it's clear to me that with, with only five and a half years left, I don't think we're going to be able to get that entire 82%. But this isn't an all or nothing thing. It's not, we can't just say, oh, we're, n we're not going to hit it, so we're not even going to try. We have to get as far along the path as we can and get as close to net zero by 2030 as we possibly can. We're off to a slow start a lot more policy is needed, and I'm hopeful that this new council and new administration is going to really step up from where we've been at and implement a lot more robust policies. For example, and, and to Lena's point, you've got a room full and a city full of people that are ready and eager to help. So we're not just saying this is on the 12 of you, the 13 of you, and the city team to, to do this. We're, we're here to help you and be a partner in this work. And I think we need, just as one example, because my time's running out, we need um, building performance standards to, to drive down emissions in buildings. Our current patchwork of building policies isn't enough. Um, and we also need to enforce existing city policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Ryan Hagen to be followed by Dan Castrogiano. Hey everybody, my name is Ryan Hagen. Uh, I'm new to Burlington and excited to be here. And thank you all for your service and congrats on the new positions. Um, I just wanted to echo what many people are saying here about you know, getting the accounting around the climate action plan to be more comprehensive um, and acting as, as quickly as possible in all this. Um, I think it, is almost impossible to move too quickly or too boldly on climate action. And uh, yeah, I think the planetary emergency is the biggest challenge we face right now, both globally and locally. Um, and I would urge you, I would hope that you look, that you make sustainability sort of the organizing principle of the policy and investment decisions that are being made because I think it touches everything and every policy and investment really is an opportunity to move forward um, in the right direction when it comes to this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up we have Dan Castrogano uh, to be followed by, and I'm sorry if I'm reading this last name wrong, uh, Jackson Walls. Thanks, hi, Mayor and uh, City Council. Thanks, yeah, Castragano, I appreciate that. Um, here to also speak on climate tonight, um, the Biden administration just approved something called the Seaport Oil Terminal off the coast of Texas, which 
um, is going to be new fossil fuel infrastructure, which will be two million barrels of oil every single day uh, being exported from the United States, which shows that we need action at every level, um, and that means locally here in Burlington. Um, so that was news just this week. Um, uh, I urge everybody, um, all 13 of you, to follow through on your campaign promises um, to take climate action. Um, and speaking specifically to the roadmap, um, I think we need a new plan. Um, this plan uh, does not include the two biggest sources of emissions that the city of Burlington owns and operates, so that's the McNeil Generating Station and the airport, so we need, to, we need a new plan um, and we need to decouple it from our utility. So it has to be somebody else in charge. It's been five years, we need a new plan. We need to count everything appropriately and then we need to be really, really aggressive to get to zero emissions um, as quickly as we can. Um, that also includes things like walk, bike infrastructure and public transit and as Lena and Jack both said, there are so many people here who are willing to help um, there's a lot of expertise, there are a lot of volunteers, um, even something as simple as like quick build infrastructure to put in bike lanes. Like you need volunteers and the city does not have money because there's a budget deficit, we'll do it. So just let us know how we can help and please take action as quickly as you can. Thank you. Thanks Dan. Uh, next we have Jackson Wools to be followed by Chris Gish and then Lee Morgan is our last speaker in person. Uh, thank you, City Council. I uh, wanted to um, echo the uh, concerns of some of the other residents regarding the uh, Burlington uh, climate plan. Uh, I agree that um, uh, not enough is being done, and I would like to see more done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we next have Chris Gish and then Lee Morgan. Um, I'm also here to talk to you all tonight about the net zero roadmap. By BED's own statistics, we are well behind where we would need to be to meet the goals they set in the net zero roadmap by 2030. In BED's IRP, the integrated resource plan they submitted to the PUC, they admit that they are not planning to meet net zero goals even by 2040 and are expecting electrification to mirror national trends. But that's not even what I really want to talk to you about tonight because the whole net zero energy plant roadmap needs to be scrapped. The term net zero actually refers to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. It does not refer to eliminating fossil fuel use in some sectors while ignoring most of the emissions that we cause in the city. Specifically, um, our current roadmap ignores emissions from, quote, renewable gas and other biofuels and it ignores all the emissions from McNeil and the airport. Um, these two facilities, McNeil and the airport that we operate, the city of Burlington, each emit roughly twice the total carbon budget included in the roadmap. So that means that about 80% of the emissions in the city aren't even counted at all in this roadmap. Our previous mayor called this document the, quote, most ambitious climate policy of any city in America which is shameful to my eyes. It's shameful to make a plan that ignores most of the emissions your city causes and then call it ambitious and a model for other cities to follow. I'm really hopeful that this new council and new administration um, can make a new start and make some real progress for climate action. We should not have our utility, which operates the most polluting facility in the state, coordinate our climate plan. Um, we need a new plan developed by a new office outside of BED to develop the plan accountable by a to a citizen advisory board, and then we need to take action now. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We have Lee Morgan, and then we have one speaker signed up online, Karen Sita. Hello, folks. My name is Lee Morgan. I live in Ward 7, and my pronouns are they, them. I'm here to ask you tonight uh, to vote unanimously to extend the funding uh, for the CRT program past its pilot period. Um, my thoughts are a little scattered because as I was sitting here, um, I was looking at the agenda items and I read the report uh, for CRT. Uh, and I'm deeply moved. Uh, the, the results are incredible. I think it's, it's undeniable that it's working. 
Um, so I want to talk to you about why I think a unanimous vote is important. Um, you know, back before I got sober over 16 years ago, uh, clean and sober, uh, I mean, the, just the medical intervention, dismal. I mean, it was pretty much limited to getting your stomach pumped or drinking a car uh, charcoal milkshake, and that was about it. Um, also, the, the attitude even among medical professionals, much different than it is now. Um, I remember having a lot of conversation with medical professionals about willpower or, or being treated like this was, this was like an issue of, of my morals or my character or my drive or ambition. Um, and it's just not. And we know that now. Like, and, and that's the thing that's very different. And, you know, I think something that gets lost a little bit when we think of the fire department and firefighters, uh, any firefighter who's also an EMT is a medical professional and a subject matter expert, and we need to listen to the medical professionals. Um, and we need to listen to the people who have, who have uh, been affected by the CRT program. I've talked to people who live on the street. I've talked to people who have received the services. I've talked to street outreach. And, I mean, it's, it's a re the re opinion is resounding that this is saving lives and um, you know if if you're thinking of voting no I would urge you to think of an amendment that you can live with I think we need to, to show everybody how important this is um, and I'm just so moved by the results and I hope you are too thanks thanks very much Lee uh, we have no other speakers signed up here in Contoy's auditorium we have one speaker signed up online um, Will the clerk's office put the timer uh, up online? Or is that something I'm supposed to do? Okay. All right, uh, Karen Sita is the one individual signed up online. Karen, you should be able to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me, Mr. President? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you, President. Powers, uh, I just want to say I, be, I usually show up, but I've been too busy freeing my girls from the bare minimum and freeing my girls from the imprisonment of self-hate. And most importantly, I've been very busy showing the federal courts and one day the U.S. Supreme Court how pretty girl problems are indeed constitutional legal problems. Heavy is the crown, but in my case, heavy is the scepter. I do want to say, Mr. President, it is my hope that the new mayor uh, Mayor Mulvaney Stanek will create a proclamation on the behalf of Black people, African people, just as quickly as there was a proclamation created on the behalf of LGBTQ community. I understand her loyalty to that group, but I also have my loyalties to my group, and you can't blame a girl for being loyal. And another thing I do want to say, um, many people might, there is no secret that I hold sincerely held religious beliefs. However, it does not mean that I cannot engage with this new council and the new mayor with an MLK type of love, a Jesus type of love. Because honestly, if I had to choose between my sins, I prefer the sin of vanity than the sin of being a hater. So I just wanted to make that very clear. And by the way, I do want to say I enjoy seeing women like Mayor Von Vaney Stanek and Councilor Shannon competing for high paying high leadership positions. Ladies, this is where we should be competing. Nothing else matters except competitions like that. So I do want to say um, that's all I have to say. And also shout out to Cowboy Carter, shout out to Beyonce for reminding me that I can be a black girl and enter white spaces and be okay and happy and be a pretty happy black girl. They do exist, especially in the state of Vermont. So shout out to Miss Carter. Like Miss Beyonce, you will never break my soul and you can never dim my light. Shout out to all my girl bosses too. Boss hard. Thank you, Mr. President. Go ahead and close public forum. Uh, we'll turn back now to item three on our agenda and welcome uh, Jamie Fian to the table. Jamie Fian works at uh, Primer Piper Eggleston and Kramer here in Burlington and has been the city's representative uh, in Montpelier this legislative session. I know it's a busy time right now in Montpelier, so I appreciate your making your way back to uh, Burlington here, Jamie. Um, I know we had initially set this for uh, 30 minutes in, in an earnest attempt to get us back on track. I'm gonna try to shave five minutes off of that and we'll put maybe 25 minutes up on the clock if that's possible, or we'll, we'll try to keep ourselves honest to that. And uh, Jamie, if you have a presentation of sorts that you could keep to uh, up to 10 minutes, that would be great. Thank you for being here. Yes, no, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, 
it is a busy time. I look forward to a German when I can get my hair cut uh, at some point. But uh, uh, I am Jamie Fian with Permer Piper, Eggleston and Kramer, and it's been my uh, privilege to be the legislative liaison between the city and uh, the legislature for the past several years. Um, I am cognizant of your time, so I'll speak to wherever issues you want to speak to, but uh, there are a few priorities that have been identified both by the, the mayor's office and you all that I am uh, prepared to provide an update. Um, let me first just speak to the legislative calendar. Uh, things are starting to pick up in Montpelier with a pace towards adjournment. Um, I think they are on target for a mid-May timeframe for that adjournment date. A couple of must-pass moving bills are starting to come out of committee. First and foremost, the uh, fiscal year 25 budget bill is about to be voted on in Senate appropriations. It's that budget bill that really drives the length of the session and everything else has to be ready to go with it uh, or it doesn't uh, make it. Um, as we approach these final weeks, we'll start to see some of the issues uh, funnel or winnow down. Um, and also, as is typical in the Vermont legislature at least, uh, we'll start to see uh, uh, issues appear on other bills. They'll take a bill that is somewhat germane to the issue and combine it with bills uh, to consolidate and make it easier to get across the, uh, the finish line. Uh, the budget bill is one example that often is home to many, many policy bills that up until this point are standalone pieces of legislation. So it'll be a, a, a confusing time over the next couple of weeks, um, but we'll do our best to try to keep those uh, clear for you. In terms of specific Burlington issues, uh, the, this year's municipal charter change is making its way through the process. That is H881. That is the sole change is uh, expanding BED's line of credit for liquidity and capital purposes if needed. Uh, that bill received unanimous support in the House Government Operations Committee and is now on the House calendar for consideration this week. Uh, I expect it will pass. I expect the Senate Government Operations Committee will take it up quickly and similarly pass the bill. So that's on a good track. Um, last year's charter change, H-474, related to just cause or no cause evictions, continues to be pending in House Government Operations Committee where it hasn't received any attention to date. I can tell you that there was a study to look at just cause and no cause evictions added to a separate housing bill, H-829, by the House a couple of weeks ago. Um, that bill has been referred to the Senate Economic Development Committee uh, where its fate is uncertain at the moment, not because of the charter change, or excuse me, the eviction study, but uh, there's some multiple uh, appropriations for housing and other housing related issues that will likely end up in the, uh, the budget bill. The controversy is related to the funding source that the House attached to these housing improvements, which is a personal income tax uh, proposal. Um, Mr. President, if there are any questions as I move along, feel any, or anyone, feel free to, to interrupt me on, on these bills. Uh, whatever your procedure is, I'm happy to reflect to that. Sure. Uh, very much appreciate your being here. Um, and, and I will say, just got some feedback from some folks. I, I know you have to almost, like, it's almost uncomfortably close how close you have to get this microphone. Um, but why don't we just take a brief pause there. And I'll turn to our counselors here at the table to see if they have any questions um, for you. And then depending on time, if there's any additional issues you'd like to turn back to, we can go, to, go from there. Yeah, there's certainly additional issues I want to speak no to. No doubt. Yeah. Um, why don't we briefly just stop here for a moment. Are there any counselors at the moment that have any questions for Mr. Fian? Okay, Councilor Carpenter. I guess too. And, um, the proposal to um, do an income tax for those over 500000 is not going to fly? Is that your assessment? Well, it, it, what I'm hearing is that there's not an appetite in the Senate to take it up at this point. So does that effectively kill the proposals for the housing that might have been tied to it? No. As I say, the budget will contain the housing. It's really a matter of how much is available to put towards housing within the budget construct. So I fully expect there will be money towards housing programs, rental assistance, et cetera. It's just a matter of, again, how much the budget writers are able to negotiate. Okay, and the other question I had, there's a lot of um, work going on around permit reform. One of the issues we had followed was um, wanting delegated authority in Act 250 I understand that's been 
move to another strategy of designating tiers that would be exempt, um, which might be acceptable, but I'm just curious on the timeline that that might, if, if they go that route, adopt the tiers, what would that mean for Burlington in terms of our ability or the timing of when that might happen? Yep, uh, and, and housing is one I was gonna speak to a little bit later, but absolutely we can speak to it now. Um, the House has passed a significant bill, H-687, I believe the number is, uh, I'll, I'll check my notes, which does just that. It, there were numerous studies over the last uh, 18 months or so that looked at Act 250 reform and the best method to go about doing that. Um, you're right, the city has advocated for several years now um, saying uh, cities like Burlington that have robust Act 250 zoning and permitting of its own that don't really see the benefit of having a duplicative Act 250 review shouldn't have to have that Act 250 review. Um, that effort, I, I firmly believe, has helped to support what is being proposed in several bills, including this House Pass 687, which designates certain tiers based upon designation, urban versus rural, uh, based upon existing infrastructure to be able to handle uh, proposed growth and planning, um, with the idea that the state, or at least this legislature, wants to encourage growth in these urban uh, areas that are, that are situated for it, and in, in return to have less growth in the more rural areas. And so uh, Burlington would fall under what's known as the Tier 1A, which is for those locations that have designated areas that have all those factors that I referenced before. Each of the bills under consideration in the Senate Natural Resources Committee at the moment have a Tier 1A variation or element to them. It's not controversial. The uh, controversy rests with you know, other parts of the bill that may or may not be uh, suitable for all. Um, but uh, I'm hopeful that a Tier 1A will, will uh, get through the process. In terms of timeline, there are some variations uh, depending upon the bill, how quickly that'll happen. Um, but there's an effort to move that up as quickly as possible. Uh, I believe I remember seeing 2026 would be around there um, with perhaps earlier uh, implementation steps in 2025. Uh, another housing issue is emergency housing, uh, an issue that I know has been a priority for you all and for the mayor's office. Um, the, there are several moving pieces here. The FY25 budget bill has uh, several uh, tens of millions of dollars directed towards uh, emergency housing. By this I mean uh, general assistance program. Um, there's also a separate bill, H879, that has passed the House and is pen pending in the Senate that will modernize the general assistance program to be, uh, well, it's, it's put it in statute, have it more transparent, more predictable, uh, and that will address the program in FY26 moving forward. The thinking is that uh, to learn uh, over the next year about the implications, implications of this new program uh, and maintain the existing program uh, with additional funding for the next uh, fiscal year. So I'm confident uh, that this will be addressed in either the budget or in this standalone H-879. Um, I think we touched on most, you know, there are some other housing bills that I'll continue to uh, allude to in my written updates to you all. I do want to talk to public transit uh, issues and developments. Um, the annual T-bill is one of those must-pass bills, much like the appropriate, or the general fund budget bill, the T-bill appropriates money in the transportation sector for various modes, for infrastructure, and for administration. Uh, the Senate Transportation Committee has included in its version of the T-bill a $1 million one-time bridge fund funding to Green Mountain Transit to address its uh, financial uncertainties. It's contingent on a few things, including a resumption of fares, uh, discussions with uh, other transit agencies on uh, more efficient commuter routes that overlap or interlap uh, various service territories, as well as Green Mountain Transit looking at its own uh, uh, administrative efficiencies, route efficiencies, and others. Uh, so this is poised to be adopted by the Senate, uh, possibly by the end of this week, certainly soon thereafter. Uh, Green Mountain Transit is going to be appearing in front of the House Transportation Committee this week to also make its pitch for additional funding beyond what's uh, currently in the budget. And uh, 
So that'll be a, a, a subject, I believe, of negotiation in the conference committee form between the House and the Senate for uh, the T-bill. Also in the T-bill um, is upwards of four and a half to as much as $7 million in some federal carbon reduction funds, which will be used for capital purchases of electric vehicle uh, for, elect for, for, for transit fleet, both uh, in Green Mountain Transit and other transit providers around the state. So in other words, to remove the diesel and other fossil fuel vehicles from, from their fleet. Um, there's hope that that can make a pretty good dent in the current fleet and, uh, as I say, move towards more efficient and, in a lot of cases, right-size the vehicles to be uh, reflective of the route and not necessarily the larger vehicles that we see uh, around now. Um, switching gears to substance abuse prevention and treatment, uh, the Senate Health and Welfare Committee is poised to act this week on H72, which will set up uh, an overdose prevention center pilot here in Burlington. Um, that committee has been considering testimony for the last uh, several weeks, including last week from, from Mayor Mulvaney Stanek, who brought to the committee a couple of amendments, uh, largely in reflection to a meeting she had with Burlington Fire Department as the EMS responders. Um, and those amendments were warmly received. They were primarily related to the, uh, the trained staff that will be on site to both uh, provide treatment when necessary, but also to perhaps reduce the number of EMS calls that may be uh, sent to the facility. Uh, the second amendment was to, there no, like any pilot, there's a lot of uh, studies and reports that we'll do back uh, based upon how it unfolds. Um, but the suggestion was originally to look at uh, the impact on uh, opioid overdoses and the fire department and the mayor's office felt why not broaden that study because EMS calls are in addition, not only just overdoses, but in addition, addition to other opioid related uh, issues. And so, uh, as I say, the committee is poised to adopt those amendments and a bill moving forward. It has a funding attached to it of $1.1 million that will come from the state's opioid settlement, uh, advisory settlement fund. So, and there is capacity in that fund for this appropriation. So I'm hopeful that will also uh, emerge from committee this week and have, it'll have to go to the Appropriations Committee before it goes to the Senate floor. I think I'll stop there and see if you have any questions of these issues that I've talked about or some others that I haven't. Sure. Uh, Councilor Broderick and then Councilor Newbezer. Thank you. Um, going back to transportation, um, I'm wondering, given the current uh, GMT funding stipulations, has there been any talk in the future of having a path and the steps to reach a path to return to fair, free public transit while also being able to keep GMT funded? There has been a recent study to look at uh, funding of transit in, in Vermont, uh, the most recent being this past year, and it's been studied previous to that. Um, that was being driven not only by the declining revenues that GMT was experiencing primarily for uh, going fare free during the pandemic and until you know this month um, but also the sort of the the struggles that transit agencies are facing trying to raise revenue locally either through property taxes through assessments through uh, in-kind contributions from businesses etc uh, currently the state's rural providers are fare free um, and that is a much smaller financial appropriation. I believe it's around a $500,000 appropriation as opposed to 2.9 million or so for Green Mountain Transit to continue fare free. Um, but it's a, it's a different, it, you can't compare the two because Green Mountain Transit system is different than the other rural providers. The other, some of the other rural providers are already fare free even before you know, the pandemic era uh, imposition of fare free across the state. Um, so it's a driving factor, but it's not a sole factor in terms of Dream Mountain Transit's fiscal picture. It really is a combination of all of the above and really a need for a more predictable and stable funding source in the future to be added to what's currently there. Um, so talking about a stable funding source, what has been raised in terms of how can we in the future, what are our options for a stable funding source going forward on any level of government? Yeah, the recommendations from the most recent study uh, focused on, uh, they try to tie it to some sort of nexus, right, so that there's a, a nexus to the transportation system. Um, 
and there were a series of proposals that were floated to the legislature. Uh, one was to uh, either have uh, a surcharge or uh, increase in the motor vehicle registration fee. Um, you, you could also sort of change the nature of that fee from a one time for one fee for all to an ad valorem, which is kind of based on ability to pay, value of vehicle, et cetera. Um, there was a proposal to uh, add a tax on uh, delivery of, uh, home delivery of, uh, well, what we receive from UPS and others, what's <laughs> retail, retail delivery of, of uh, uh, goods, those in excess of $100. Um, and there are a series of other types of user type fees that I mentioned. Um, the legislature uh, reviewed the report. At this point, I wouldn't say there's a political appetite to enact any of those at the moment. Um, I think there's also concern by some in the legislature that they need to look at the transportation fund in general, which is also underperforming because of declining gas tax revenues, because of uh, other uh, longstanding revenues that uh, continue to be a challenge. And so transit will certainly be an element within that larger uh, look, but at this point, we've given them plenty of opp opportunities and options to find some additional revenues, just rather, as I say, the political will to pick one of those. Thank you. Uh, how much time do I have in my five minutes? Am I still good? One more question? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, we have, I would say, about eight or nine more minutes on this topic before wanting to move on to the next one. So if, if you have one other question, then we'll turn to Councillor Newbezer and see if there's any other councillors. I'll, I'll withhold my last question. I'll, 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 put it, I'll put it as an email. It's not as pertinent to Burlington as probably the rest of the questions. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Broderick. Councillor Newbezer? Um, just a quick comment and then a question for you um, and a, potentially a request. Um, one, I just in general, I hope that the city, <laughs> in your role, just in general, we can agree um, that we ought to be asking those at the very top to be paying their fair share as a way to generate new revenue. And I know that's a controversial <laughs> idea in Montpelier, um, but it seems obvious, particularly when all of our constituents are facing, facing record uh, property tax hikes. Um, additionally, so I, I did read through your report, which is really helpful, and I really appreciate the work, um, so thank you for that. I didn't see a section on climate in particular, and so I wondered, uh, I imagine it's a holdover, all of your work is probably a holdover from previous administration, you're switching to a new administration in the middle of a legislative session. Um, but I wondered if at this point it is possible to get updates on climate, even if it was sort of top priorities. I'm, I'm thinking in particular, there's a bill on thermal networks, there's a bill uh, reforming the renewable energy standard, um, and ratepayer protection as well that I think are probably really pertinent to our work here on the council. Thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, to your point, I'm happy to add a, a whole new sort of category for climate-related bills. Great. Councilor Litwin. Thanks, um, and thank you for the helpful report as well. I did want to ask a question. I became sort of aware that um, through Dr. Levine's testimony um, on the Senate Appropriations Bill that there was about $800,000 worth of cuts to prevention measures. Um, and uh, simultaneously while we're talking about harm reduction. Um, and so when I read your report, it looked like that $795,000 was coming out of the opioid abatement special fund for prevention coalitions, um, whereas Dr. Levine was sort of, um, and, and you know, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but he was saying that essentially those cuts violated state law, and I just wondered, um, are you in connection with Dr. Levine on this issue? Are you following this issue um, in these cu cuts, or are there cuts at all, and it's just a matter of the money's getting moved around. Um, I haven't had a chance to catch up on where that's at. Yeah, I, thank I, you. I don't have the specifics. I can certainly look into that a little bit further for, for all of you. Um, there has been some disagreement between uh, Dr. Levine and uh, some members of the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee in terms of you know, permissible uses, et cetera, and how it shows up, but I'll certainly try to find some answers for you on that particular item. Thanks very much. Yep. Thanks, Councillor Litwin. Uh, Councillor Grant, and then is that Councillor Kane? Okay. 
Um, I also would like to thank you for your report. Um, I really appreciate the detail. And I do encourage the residents in the city to go to Civic Clerk, take a look at the um, documentations that are attached to the various agenda items uh, to really get an idea of what our legislature is working on. Uh, the one thing I had a question about that I didn't see a um, item on was the situation where we have our state's attorneys um, in all of the different counties who have a significant backlog and certain cases take a while. And if you have a case that say involves an act of violence, that's gonna be bumped on to the front of the line with regards to court time before something like shoplifting, even if someone is a, a repeat offender. So my question is with um, the governor putting forth the cuts on uh, having more prosecutors available and help for our state's attorneys, the idea of a particular tax increase, like where does that stand? Does that pretty much look like it's going to get vetoed? Does it, if it is, does it seem to have the votes to override it? Yeah, there's certainly a commitment or desire of this legislature to fund the judiciary for a number of reasons, but the backlog is, of course, you know, right up there among the priorities. Um, there are a couple of different approaches. The House uh, has chosen H880, uh, which I believe is the bill you're referring to, which is sort of uh, judiciary funding, access to justice, et cetera. The funding for that is um, supported by an increase in the corporation corporate income tax, uh, as well as uh, removing a couple of Vermont deductions for uh, that are available at the federal tax level for corporations. I think they're offshore intangible income and one other that's escaping my memory at the moment. Um, that bill's been sent to the Senate uh, where I think the corporate income taxes uh, are also facing a challenge. Um, however, the Senate, again, will be using the budget. As I say, it is a priority to fund the judiciary uh, to address the backlog. Uh, and I do expect that the Senate version of the budget will have that funding in it when it comes out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Kane, and then we're going to wrap up. Okay, thank you for the memos. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you for the memos you've circulated. Uh, I noticed there was a, um, an item related to a short-term rental tax, and the city has, has a short-term rental ordinance as well that we're using to fund our, our housing trust fund. So I'm wondering, um, do you know if the the short-term rental tax at the state level would, would preempt our, our local ordinance or if, if it would be unaffected? My understanding is it would be unaffected, that right. any surcharge would be in addition to what's currently being collected. So, uh, and the latest is a bill in House Ways and Means, which will be this year's education funding bill that will set the property tax rates and yields for the next fiscal year, has a 1.5% surcharge on short-term rentals. Um, and and uh, I believe that's estimated to raise $6 million, which will go towards the end fund to help buy down a potential property tax increase overall. Thanks. Yep. And then a couple other quick things. I just wanted to echo what Councillor Newbizer was saying about climate being included. I would appreciate that as well. Sure. Um, I was reading recently that the state of Minnesota has a bunch of initiatives related to networked geothermal grants, a pilot program, um, uh, there's also a rebate program. There are, I think, four separate bills, um, and I'm not aware of exactly what's being worked on at, at the state level here and would appreciate being briefed on that. And on, on another note, I would appreciate being briefed as well on universal child care efforts. I know that there was uh, a bill to explore e expansion of universal um, child care in, in the state. I'm not quite sure where it stands, it came up in conversation um, related to uh, universal health care. Uh, Brian China established Universal Health Care Caucus and, um, you know, potentially starting with, uh, you know, just children um, maybe providing health care as part of a universal child care program and then increasing the elig eligibility age would be a way to... Um, to move towards a universal healthcare system. So it's of interest to me to just uh, be, be briefed on any uh, movement on that topic. Sure. Thank um, you. 
yes again on the climate. That'll certainly be an element going forward. Um, I will say, you know, with three or so, four weeks left in the legislature, introducing new topics at the, this point is very difficult. Their bandwidth for that is pretty pretty narrow. Um, and, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, last year was a significant year for child care uh, legislation, both in terms of infrastructure and funding. Um, and I think the legislature is probably focused on implementing what they did last year. Um, but I'm certainly keep my eyes and arrows open for other initiatives. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Kane. Um, Mr. Fian, I appreciate your being here. appreciate the reports. As always, uh, your last report is posted online. We received a report from you dated April 15th, which to Councillor Grant's point uh, should be uploaded here shortly. I'm going to give Councillor McKnight the last word here, and then, then we will wrap up this item. So sure. I'll, I'll say a preemptive thanks for being here, and now turn to Councillor McKnight. Thank you. I'll be quick. Um, Given the uh, disturbing recent history in Burlington of gun violence, I was happy to see some progress in the legislature uh, with the um, bill to ban ghost guns. And I was just curious if you could give us a brief update on where you think, uh, on sort of the chances of that bill passing, um, because it's very relevant to the safety here in Burlington. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that, that's Senate Bill 209, which has passed the Senate, is currently in the House Judiciary Committee where it may receive a vote this week, in fact. So I do believe this chances of passing are, are uh, very good. Uh, the House Committee actually has gone one step further and has proposed amending the bill to uh, prohibit uh, possession or carrying of firearms that's still being worked out at polling places or dangerous weapons. So it would go beyond prohibiting manufacture, sale, distribution of, of so-called ghost guns to also in include this other element. Uh, that is a change that wasn't in the Senate bill, so it would have to go back to the Senate, but I am uh, confident that the underlying ghost gun piece will make it across. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McKnight, and thank you very much, Great. Mr. Fian. Thanks again we'll for the again time. Soon. Appreciate it. Um, we would now turn to item five on our agenda, which is uh, an update from General Manager Springer on Net Zero Energy. Um, but General Manager Springer, before turning to you, we do have one other meeting that the City Council must attend to tonight, which we had posted for starting at 7.15, and in case there's any um, applicants that are tuned in, um, we only have a consent agenda for our local control commission. And so I would suggest that we um, actually recess the City Council meeting at 8.04 p.m. now and just briefly turn to our local control commission. And um, Commissioner Shannon, could I turn to you for a motion on adopting the agenda for our local control commission? I move to adopt the agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Shannon. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Grant. Uh, any discussion on the agenda? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have an agenda. As mentioned before, we only have a consent agenda before uh, the Local Control Commission. Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated on Civic Clerk? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Shannon. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Commissioner Grant. Any discussion on the consent agenda? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? That's unanimous. Seeing no other business, we will adjourn the meeting of the Local Control Commission and we will resume the full City Council meeting at 8.05 p.m. And thank you, General Manager Springer, for being here. I think we shaved uh, five minutes off the 30 minutes for Mr. Fian. We'll, we'll shave five minutes off the 30 minutes for you as well. Uh, but I know this is an important issue and appreciate your being here. Uh, if you have a presentation for the Council, and then we'll, then we'll turn to Councilors. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Darren Springer, General Manager with Burlington Electric. Uh, while we just load the presentation, since we're following the legislative discussion, I did want to add uh, that Burlington Electric's been engaged on the Renewable Energy Standard, H-289. Very supportive of that. We work with VPIRG, Renewable Energy Vermont, on that bill. Uh, thermal Networks, we've been engaged on that as well. So we're, we're working on a number of these items uh, that are of interest uh, and trying to be supportive in Montpelier. Um, glad to share more on that. Um, I think if we can go to the first uh, main slide here. Um, so Burlington Electric is your municipal public power electric utility uh, for well over 100 years. Um, we have 123 employees, including 86 IBEW member positions uh, within uh, Burlington Electric and our generating stations. Um, we are the third largest utility in the state of Vermont. We're relatively small. Um, we're about 6% of the state's load, uh, even though we are the largest municipal utility in the state. Um, we are 100% renewable since 2014, first city in the nation that did that. 
Um, and as you can see here, we have um, about uh, a kind of uh, three quarters of our customers are residential. Um, but if you think about our energy use, it's actually flipped. It's more like three quarters of our energy use is commercial. And you think about uh, the university, the medical center, the city itself being larger institutions, um, larger amount of our energy use is commercial. Um, and then, you know, in terms of our load, that's a little bit um, high, the 330,000 megawatt hours. That's a, more of a pre-pandemic figure. Uh, we've been uh, kind of closely uh, getting, getting closer to the pre-pandemic, but um, uh, roughly a 65 megawatt uh, peak. And if you think about the state of Vermont grid as a whole, it's about 1,000 megawatts. So again, we're about six, six and a half percent of the state uh, when you think about it that way. Um, and we are located on Electric Avenue there at uh, 585 Pine Street. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're here to talk about the 2030 uh, Net Zero Energy Roadmap. Um, I've included uh, a few slides where we have artwork from some of our 2023 and 2024 uh, Net Zero Energy Calendar Contest winners, uh, fourth graders around the city participate. And, uh, and this one I, I really like because this uh, F-150 Lightning that was drawn at the top here uh, predated us having our own F-150 Lightning in our fleet, which we now have several of them. So uh, we really appreciate the vision from some of our fourth grade artists and giving us ideas for what we can do to electrify our fleet. Um, the, the Net Zero Energy Roadmap uh, has been recognized by the Smart Electric Power Alliance as the first U.S. Net Zero uh, plan in the space. As, as I think uh, counselors know, it's focused primarily on the thermal sector, so heating, buildings, and the ground transportation sectors. And there's a reason for that, which is uh, when we look at the state of Vermont as a whole, uh, those sectors are responsible in a given year for 70 to 75 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions when you look at the state emissions inventory. Um, you know, thermal and transportation are going to make up more than 5 million metric tons of CO2 emissions uh, out of a state inventory that's around 8 million uh, metric tons. So that's the reason why we focus on those two sectors. Doesn't mean there's not work that can be done outside of those sectors, but the Net Zero Energy Roadmap was really about tackling the two biggest sources of emissions in the state and two of the largest sources certainly in the country as well. Um, we update the roadmap annually with Synapse Energy Economics out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. They're our partner in uh, in initially in putting the roadmap together and giving us the updates uh, each year, uh, drawing on a variety of data sources. And uh, really, this is not a Burlington Electric initiative. It's a city initiative. It's a community initiative. It involves uh, many partners, including all the departments of the city, uh, external organizations. Really, the state and federal government play a significant role in whether or not we make progress as well. Um, and I'll touch on that a little bit as we go. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I know there are uh, earnest concerns within public comment about wanting to make more progress. I share that. Um, but we're actually here tonight having made some positive progress uh, since 2022. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, so greenhouse gas emissions in the sectors we track are down 18.2% in 2023 relative to the 2018 baseline. Uh, 2018 was the year prior to the issuance of the roadmap, so we've used it as a baseline uh, for the city, and we've tracked data every year since. Um, 2023 had the second largest reduction uh, at 8% uh, behind the pandemic year of 2020, where we had a 14% reduction for uh, clear reasons in terms of the economy being relatively uh, diminished that year. Um, and in particular, natural gas consumption in 2023 uh, dropped and is at its lowest level uh, since any year we've tracked during the roadmap. And I'll get into a little more about that as well. Uh, again, we have a great calendar contest. Uh, we have an electric bus there on the front cover of the 2024 Net Zero Energy Calendar. And of course, one of our electric buses here in the Green Mountain Transit Fleet that Burlington Electric helped to incentivize. Uh, we expect to see a number more electric buses uh, come into the fleet in the very near future. Um, next slide, please. Um, so a couple of barometers that are, are helpful um, in a way to compare. Uh, we look at natural gas use uh, down 19% since 2018 in Burlington. Uh, statewide, it's down 9% over the same time frame. And I'll, I'll cover a little more detail on that when we get to the graphs. Um, and similarly, in terms of ground transportation, uh, we're seeing uh, progress that's ahead of the pace, certainly that we see nationally uh, and maybe at the state level as well. 
Uh, we've listed some of the things that have contributed to the progress here, not all of them, uh, but uh, obviously since the roadmap was issued, we've had a number of initiatives. Uh, we had a $20 million net zero energy revenue bond uh, that we're investing in incentives and infrastructure to support the city's initiatives. I mentioned electrifying the fleet, uh, not only the Green Mountain Transit buses, but the city fleet as a whole. Um, we have our first electric uh, bucket truck for our line crews pictured here in the state of Vermont uh, that we put in service uh, late last year. Uh, we're hoping to have more of those. Um, one thing that may not be immediately uh, obvious, but is definitely um, something that since the pandemic has been a clear driver is, we are seeing a sustained trend of reduced vehicle miles traveled uh, coming out of the pandemic. I think remote work, hybrid work is contributing to that uh, trend and that's helping us um, in ways that uh, maybe we wouldn't have predicted when we put the roadmap together. Um, EV infrastructure, we have invested in public stations around the community. We also support through incentives uh, properties that are uh, rental and multifamily installing chargers, uh, home chargers, commercial chargers. Uh, we really have a suite of programs to support EV charging um, and obviously dozens of electrification incentives, everything from heat pumps, geothermal, electric vehicles, electric lawnmowers, electric forklifts, uh, electric bikes. If you can electrify it, we'd probably have a program to help. Um, and uh, if not, we are interested in figuring one out. Uh, and, and city policies, the renewable heating ordinance, the rental weatherization ordinance, the carbon fee ordinance all play a role and will play an increasing role um, in this data as we go forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, so really one of the things we can look at in terms of our progress is we really boosted our incentives um, in June of 2020 in the midst of the pandemic and we've seen a real trend upward in terms of adoption uh, after that significant increase. Um, and here you can just see some of our team, uh, Itameno, who is our energy equity analyst, um, Jen Green on the left, the director of sustainability, um, and uh, one of our, our uh, advertisements about heat pumps uh, here on the right. Um, next slide, please. So this is one of the programs that we track. Uh, tier three, which is part of the renewable energy standard at the state level, enables us to offer uh, incentives for things like heat pumps. Um, we have over 2,300 heat pumps now installed in Burlington. Um, and you can see the growth curve uh, about 25X uh, in adoption since the green stimulus period, since June of 2020. Um, so a really uh, a nice upward trend there. Obviously we wanna see it continue to grow uh, more exponentially, but we've seen some good progress with heat pumps in the city. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in addition, we offer enhanced incentives for income qualified customers in almost every category, including our, our biggest categories being electric vehicles and heat pumps. We've seen a growing percentage of our rebates uh, be uh, for income qualified customers, as you can see here, 21% uh, of our EV and plug-in hybrid rebates, 14% of our heat pump rebates, and we're doing a lot of work to try to boost the adoption rate uh, in those categories as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we're gonna get into a few of the graphs, a few of the key graphs that really uh, define the roadmap uh, trends as, as we see them for 2023. Um, next slide, please. So here, um, in terms of motor gasoline and diesel consumption, we basically were flat year over year between 2022 and 2023. Um, so that leaves us with a 13% reduction between 2018 and 2023. Um, that's an area where we wanna see more progress. Uh, definitely getting electric uh, transit buses into the Green Mountain Transit Fleet will be help in this regard. Um, vehicle miles traveled, uh, really this data is a function of three things. It's how many electric vehicles are part of the overall mix in Burlington how many vehicles do we have as a whole registered and how much vehicle miles traveled are we seeing out of our Burlington residents? Um, so that's where you get this 13% reduction. Uh, important to note that over a relatively similar time frame, we don't have 2023 uh, data yet at the federal level. Uh, we had about a 4.3% reduction, so we're certainly ahead of pace at the federal level. We did flatline a little bit uh, between 22 and 23. Um, next slide, please. Um, different story on the thermal side. Um, so on the left, you can see Vermont's natural gas consumption uh, between 2018 and 2023, 9% reduction. Same time frame in Burlington, we had a 19% reduction. Uh, this is not weather normalized. So one of the pieces of information you'll want, I got this question from Councillor Broderick, um, is you know, what were the heating degree day changes uh, during that time frame? And those were 8% reduction. So, if you had just done uh, nothing and stayed essentially level, you would expect to see an 8% reduction just in the data because we are seeing a warmer uh, trend in the winter. But Burlington actually has gone well beyond that trend. Uh, so I think we can credit some of the work that's being done with heat pumps and with policy uh, initiatives in the city for helping us to 
uh, essentially you know, double or, or a little bit more than double what the trend is in Vermont in terms of reduction there. Um, we saw a bump upwards in 2022, as you can see, uh, so we were very concerned about that trend line. We're really pleased to see it moving back in the right direction. Um, next slide, please. Um, so overall emissions, um, you can see in Burlington, 18.2% reduction. Uh, in the U.S. over, again, a relatively similar time frame in the same sectors, uh, thermal for residential and commercial, motor gasoline and diesel for ground transportation, there was a 3.3% reduction. So we are outpacing uh, the trend uh, nationally by a really significant margin. The red line there is the net zero energy 2030 trend line. Um, it's a very, very ambitious curve to get down that trend line. Uh, you can see we're not quite on it at the, at the moment. We had a brief period during the pandemic where we did cross uh, with the net zero energy trend line. Then we had a mild rebound, much more mild than the rest of the country. Now we're seeing a trend downwards again. Uh, we want to get as close to that trend line as we possibly can, uh, knowing that um, overall, in terms of climate science, there's been a call for a 50% reduction in emissions by 2030, and we're trying to achieve something in these sectors that's even more ambitious than that. Um, so we keep striving towards this, uh, this goal. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is my last slide, and then I'm glad to answer questions uh, from the council. Um, I did want to note that every year as part of releasing this, we also update all of our incentive programs. We have some exciting uh, new programs this year. Uh, we were authorized by legislation that passed last year uh, to pilot, um, we're the first utility in the country to do this, a program for what's called super users, uh, and these are folks who are driving more miles than typical. Um, we worked with VPIRG on this legislation. Uh, so we have the authority now to provide an enhanced incentive, and we're doing so for customers who are driving 2x and 3x the typical number of miles in Burlington. So this is up now on our website. Those customers can access all of our regular incentives for electric vehicles, income enhanced incentives, and then can get an additional incentive. Uh, we've also made this available for food delivery, for ride sharing services, for anybody who might be putting a lot of miles on their vehicle. Um, so this is a unique pilot. We're excited to launch it and learn from it and share data with other uh, entities, not only in Vermont, but really around the country. Um, we are. Uh, going to be bringing you very soon uh, a program that our electric commission just approved, which will be the first in Vermont uh, uh, heat pump bill credit program. So the idea being that we can provide customers uh, through a federal grant that we've received of over a million dollars um, in the devices that are necessary to help uh, send signals to a heat pump during peak time periods and help reduce the usage just a little bit, which if you aggregate over a number of heat pumps, you can have a real reduction in terms of peak use uh, for the utility. Uh, in doing so, we can provide customers with a bill credit, uh, which will start at $5 a month. Uh, we hope to turn this into a long range program, but this would be an initial pilot. And the idea here is we wanna make it cheaper to run a heat pump than to heat with natural gas. Natural gas is at historically low prices um, and heat pumps uh, need to be competitive. So this is one way that we're going to be working on to try to drive that price delta down while saving every single ratepayer money if we can reduce peak use. Um, we also have the switch and save program which is for income qualified uh, water heater change outs. Uh, we're gonna be working with uh, Champlain Housing Trust and potentially Burlington Housing Authority trying to get uh, 100 to 125 residents uh, to help change out their fossil fuel or less efficient water heater to a more efficient heat pump water heater. Um, and then we have uh, several other programs as well. I've mentioned uh, electric buses. We have new EV charging incentives. Um, we've increased our e-bike incentive from $200 to $300 available at all the local bike shops. Um, we're continuing a lot of work. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, Ita and Jen in particular on uh, making sure that we have equity in our programs and access that we're reaching out in various places. Uh, ETA has held uh, office hours at the King Street Laundromat, for example. We've had uh, our energy efficiency team at Franklin Square. Uh, we want to reach the community uh, everywhere we possibly can. Um, the federal level, the Inflation Reduction Act, we're still waiting for the state to issue the income qualified rebates, which are going to really drive adoption in a number of these key categories. Um, the tax credits are available now, but the income qualified rebates are not. We're waiting on those. We'd like to see those uh, to boost adoption. Uh, the carbon fee ordinance does not affect any of the data that you've seen here because it took effect in 2024, January. So we will see as we see buildings go through that process, uh, we will see that begin to impact the data. 
Uh, I also know uh, of interest to a number of counselors, rental weatherization uh, is probably deserving of its own update and the Department of Permitting and Inspections uh, is the lead on implementing that. So they've got some thoughts, I think, in terms of how we can improve uh, the process there. We are facing a significant backlog. Uh, we are facing a workforce shortage and a program shortage there that's impacting uh, the adoption of weatherization through that ordinance. So that's something I think the council will wanna dive in on further. Um, uh, we're doing some work with buildings uh, on decarbonization outside of the policy realm. We had a geothermal webinar last week, and we have a, a heat pump focused webinar happening uh, May 7th. I think I've sent the council all uh, the information if you're interested to join. Those are open to the public. Um, and then lastly, at the state level, the clean heat standard uh, will have an impact. Uh, that is up for another vote prior to being implemented. So uh, it's being developed uh, at the PUC, but it has to come back to the legislature before it's implemented. Uh, that'll have a big impact potentially on Burlington and our progress. Um, and I will stop there, hopefully having been relatively good on time, leaving room for questions. Uh, thank you very much, General Manager Springer. And, um Thanks to really you and the whole BED team for all the work you do in this presentation. Uh, we would now turn to counselors for questions. Can I get a sense as to how many counselors would like to speak on this item? Counselors Barlow, uh, Broderick, Newbeezer, and Kane. Um, so, uh, Counselor Barlow, why don't we start with you? Thank you, President Travers. I said that for the first time. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I, my question, I had a couple of questions. I guess one is around the new EV incentives you referenced on the last slide. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I know you and I have had discussions about some of the, uh, the hiccups with current EV charging incentives, and um, I'm just wondering what new incentives are coming down the pike. Yes, um, so in terms of the incentives, what we have is uh, either a 250 or a $500 boost uh, for customers who are driving the most miles. Um, uh, the issue we've had that I think we've discussed is around the EV rate. Uh, where customers who are signed up for the EV rate are sometimes seeing, uh, through no fault of their own, but through software glitches with the technology, uh, a charging event happening during peak periods that then makes them not eligible to receive the credit uh, in a given month. So we've seen that with some of our, our vendors, and we are working on some solutions there, which could include uh, bringing forward a tariff adjustment, uh, as well as working with our vendors uh, to try to really minimize those types of incidents. And for, for everyone's benefit, the EV rate basically allows a customer to charge for the equivalent of 75 cents a gallon of gas, uh, provided you're charging off peak. Uh, the challenge is if you have a peak charging event, then you lose the credit for that month, you go back to the re residential rate. So you're not penalized, but you don't get the benefit. And what we've seen lately for reasons that we're not clear about is uh, the EV charging uh, unit itself is pulling during peak periods, even though it's not scheduled to again, through no fault of the customer. Our current tariff doesn't allow for us to forgive that, essentially, so we're looking at ways we can be more flexible, and, and we'll bring those to the council. Okay, thank you. And um, my second question was around, um, around uh, an issue that came up um, late in the last council session, which was around extending the carbon pollution impact fee to a cohort of buildings, industrial and commercial buildings, uh, less than 50,000 square feet. And I'm just interested, absent that, uh, the expansion of that fee, what work is the uh, department doing to, uh, what, to address that? Absolutely, so um, there were a number of discussions during the, the previous council uh, around uh, the cohort 25,000 to 4999 uh, square feet. And what we did uh, in the absence of anything moving forward is we did convene a group of uh, building uh, tenants and owners uh, who are in that space, uh, including institutions, businesses, uh, nonprofits. Um, and we spent um, some time uh, listening to them about some of the work they're doing, some of the challenges they see. We didn't get deep into the policy discussions yet. Uh, what we learned from that, though, was there was a, an interest in learning more on their end, both about geothermal and other commercial sector heat pumps. And so that's why we're holding the webinars that we're holding, uh, the geothermal one again last week, which is recorded and available. Uh, we partnered with the Vermont Green Building Network uh, to put that on. Um, and we had uh, Holly Francis from Champlain College talk about their system that's implemented already and that they're looking to expand. Uh, we had George Martin from Ellen Consulting, who's one of the local geothermal and heat pump experts. Um, and we had our BED Energy Services team. So there was a, a good Q&A uh, as part of that. And then again, we have a heat pump webinar coming up on the 7th of May uh, to dig in a little more on that topic. We're gonna have uh, George Martin back with us 
as well as Steve Conant from the soda plant. The soda plant has heat pumps uh, that they're using currently, uh, and Steve's going to talk about their experience with it. And uh, you know, coming out of that, we're also continuing to work with the Building Electrification Institute, which works with leading cities around the country. We just met with them today, um, and we're trying to map out with them some different uh, areas of work that we can do uh, to keep us uh, engaged and well prepared uh, for any further policy development that might take place. Okay, well, thank you. So, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Barlow. Councillor Broderick. Thank you. So my first question is about um, a little more on rental weatherization. Uh, again, obviously, it's a it's a DPI um, concern, and I can't wait to talk to Bill Ward about that as well. But in terms of um, what is BED's part in ensuring that these our rental weatherization ordinance is being properly followed through on, and um, how c could potentially some um, collaboration, if, if there is any, how collaboration between BED and DPI help that be even more followed through because obviously besides keeping folks warm and lowering utility costs by virtue of that, it also lowers emissions. So I'd like to know what your side of ensuring that ordinance is followed through on is. Yeah, absolutely. So our team was involved uh, pretty heavily in the development of that policy, uh, certainly. And we continue to meet and offer technical assistance to DPI. We meet regularly uh, and partner with them. Uh, Vermont Gas is also a key partner in this because they run the weatherization program. 95% uh, of the buildings in Burlington have natural gas service. Um, so, you know, they are the primary under the kind of Public Utility Commission uh, regulatory system. They have the efficiency funds and the weatherization funds to support uh, weatherization work in those buildings. Uh, some of the challenges I'm aware of, obviously workforce, which um, is not something that any of our departments can solve on our own, but is something that requires a, a larger effort. I know CEDO um, is really engaged on this question. Um, we also, I think, are, are facing some competition in a sense because we're doing a lot of weatherization work um, at the airport, uh, properties around the airport, and there is a limited number of, uh, you know, not only workforce, but there's a limited budget as well. Um, so I think we knew um, when this policy was developed that the time frame for getting it done was ambitious. Um, that said, it's disappointing that we haven't seen more progress, and BED certainly stands by to help in any way we can with technical assistance, with outreach, uh, with engagement to support uh, DPI, which is doing the enforcement work and the implementation work around this ordinance. Thank you. Um, and one more question. Um, is there a place that, um, not, that either council or anyone in Burlington can go to see data on the non-natural gas, um, greenhouse gas emissions, i.e. biomass? Yeah, so um, in terms of McNeil, that data is publicly reported um, and it's available, uh, I believe, on federal websites. And, you know, for reference, uh, and we do, we do track emissions there. Uh, the reference is uh, in 2023, we had 326,000 tons of emissions if you only count at the stack. Important to remember, BED is a half owner of McNeil. We don't own the entirety of the plant, so half of that output, half of those emissions would be attributable to us. Uh, the way that the state of Vermont and really um, the way that it's accounted for at, at the kind of international level in most cases uh, looks at biomass is not to count the emissions at the stack, but to count the flux in land use. So um, looking at whether or not we're losing or gaining forests, um, and it's a very complex uh, counting mechanism. So if you look in the state of Vermont emissions inventory, although there's really good discussion around this, and it is probably one of the most complex carbon accounting areas that there is, um, they don't count the emissions as part of the inventory directly. They count or they, they attempt to count uh, within the land use flux, and that's uh, similar at the, um, you know, different levels of government. So the information's available. We certainly have talked about it in the past. I would just caution that looking only at the stack emissions doesn't tell the full picture uh, for a resource like McNeil. Great. Thank you. Go to Councillor Newbezer and then Councillor Kane. So a couple quick questions and then comments, and thank you to my colleagues for indulging me. There's a lot of climate questions <clears throat> in front of us tonight that uh, we should be talking about. Um, just to be clear, I know we have an 18% roughly reduction across thermal and transit. Um, what's the percentage reduction that we were, we were aiming for in the net zero plan? Yeah, so if you were to look at the 2030 trend line, uh, we had 215,000 metric tons in 2018. Uh, we currently have 175,000 metric tons in uh, 2023. Uh, if we were on the 2030 trend line, you would have 137,000 metric tons. 
Well, just what's that percentage, just so the public and the council can compare Apple I, um, Apple. I definitely went to law school because I don't do math in my head, uh, so I won't try to do it here, but you would divide 137 by 175, you get the delta uh, between those two uh, points. I, I would just put forward, and this goes in my comments, um, there's a number of things just in terms of communicating and also getting clear information so that the council has a good understanding of where we are on climate and energy as a city um, that isn't a criticism, but I, but I think is important information for me moving forward um, so that I can make informed decisions. Um, and I think I've heard over the last number of years the, the public raise similar concerns. Um, uh, I will skip my universal rental weatherization because my colleague hit on that. Um, you, you mentioned workforce development. I would agree that's probably the biggest challenge as I understand it. Would that be your assessment as it relates to rental weatherization? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I would just pose to my colleagues that as we're trying to make tough decisions, tough decisions in FY25, um, <clears throat> that we'd look at workforce development and prioritizing uh, investing there as it relates to our climate agenda. Um, and then just moving forward, so a few reporting requests that would make, uh, I think, my life easier. Um, so, and this gets a little nitty gritty, but the presentation that you showed and you sent us um, in advance compares our overall percentage reduction to the U.S. I don't actually think that's a helpful comparison in the sense that we are a unique community and we're, we have different, more ambitious goals than the U.S., um, to be fair. And so I hope that, you know, we're a leader and I want to be compared to other leaders, I guess. Um, and so I'm hoping that both in size but also in sort of ambition around climate um, that we can find comparisons. Uh, I'm thinking like Ithaca, New York. I don't know if that would be a good one or not. But there's a number of criteria where I think um, it would be helpful to sort of see that as we look at these different areas of work. Um, okay, just offer a brief comment on that? Yeah, please. Um, so one of the challenges, I completely agree, we are a, a unique community. We, we want to be a leader. We are a leader. Uh, we work with a lot of the leading uh, cities through the Building Electrification Institute, through the uh, Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Um, we don't all have the same uh, timelines uh, for our climate goals or baselines for our climate goals. Um, so there is a challenge uh, in getting apples to apples comparisons between other cities. It's definitely something we can look at, something we can talk with some of our partners uh, to see, but um, there's different baselines, so you won't always get an apples to apples type of comparison. So I agree, uh, comparing us to the U.S. is not meant to be uh, a statement of, you know, this is our kind of baseline. It's more just to give a sense of the trend in the state and in the, uh, in the national level. Um, but really, you know, you can compare to the net zero trend line, which is, which is on the charts. Um, and we can look at some other communities. Um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, for example, has set a goal. Uh, one of their challenges, they don't have a municipal electric utility. Uh, we've done meetings with them where they've said, how do we get a municipal electric utility? And uh, so we're a little ahead uh, in that respect. Um, so we can look at some other communities and try when we present this again next year to, uh, to put some things out there. They just may not be apples to apples. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, so yeah, I'll just reiterate what we heard in the public. I think it's actually not helpful to just look at, uh, I guess what would be helpful is even quarterly, honestly, but even if it's semi-annual every six months, um, sort of a citywide, which isn't solely on B, uh, BED, but sort of a citywide report on where we are in terms of moving off uh, of, a, of polluting energy um, in every sector, um, including taking into account McNeil, including taking into account um, airport emissions um, and, and, you know, rental weatherization from another city department is a good example, um, just so that we can maximize all of our, our time. Um, the other question I had or just comment I had was, I know that the resolution, 2019 resolution initially asked that we saw annual report backs um, on the net zero roadmap. And I think one thing that I noticed was the previous administration there's also a section in there asking for semi-annual report backs, and so I read that to mean at a minimum twice a year, if not three times a year, that we're reporting back, and it's my understanding that that's only happened, there's been one report back to the council on an annual basis from, from BED, is that correct? Uh, no, so um, I think that the resolution had talked about having sem semi-annual reporting on progress towards the city's net zero energy goal. Um, the data we get, we only get once a year. Um, because a lot of this data, you really can't um, 
get it in the middle of the year. A lot of times you have to finish the year and then you can get uh, the DMV data, the different pieces. So oh, I may have run out of time. Um, you Thank keep you. Going. I'll, try to, I'll try to continue briefly. Um, the, uh, so, so in terms of the actual data, we get it once a year. Uh, the, the roadmap was issued in September of 2019. Uh, we've given, uh, BED, me personally, has given a, an update to the council every single year uh, on the net zero data uh, since that time, uh, including during the pandemic um, and including kind of what we're doing tonight. We've had a number of other presentations, updates that have related to the net zero roadmap but may not be uh, data reporting specifically but may be on discrete items relative to the city fleet or to policy or other things. So uh, there is definitely more than semi-annual conversation uh, at the council in my experience around the topic, um, but I wanna be transparent that the data is typically available once a year. Um, and we, we get it uh, around this time, uh, April, you know, usually, uh, to be able to report back, which, by the way, is way quicker than what you'll see at the state level, where the data is 2020. Um, we're at 2023, and it's actually quicker than what you see at the federal level or even in most communities. So we're ahead of the curve in terms of knowing where we are uh, relative to a number of places. Thank you, Councillor Newbezer. Um, we have uh, uh, reached our time on this agenda item, and so I appreciate you being here, General Manager Springer, Councillor Kane. I know you were next up. I'm also mindful of the fact that we are uh, now turning to our, our climate emergency reports, and so, uh, General Manager Springer, while not an opportunity to engage in back and forth, um, I would welcome your perhaps sticking around for another five to ten minutes, um, because uh, we will now turn to uh, item six in our agenda, which is climate emergency reports. And, and Councilor Kane, I would give you first crack at it if you wanted to uh, uh, offer a climate emergency report, because uh, I know we're uh, it's, it's a good segue into this discussion. Thanks, can I still interact with Darren? Um, no, we've run out of time on the agenda item for uh, zero <laughs> energy update, and so we're gonna move now to uh, our climate emergency reports, um, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, we're, we're moving to that agenda item now. Okay, well, I'm gonna say, I guess, basically what I was going to say, and there are gonna be some open questions, I guess, so I can follow up separately with Darren. So there's this graph on, on page 12 of the presentation, the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, you discussed it in relation to Councillor Newbezer's question. Um, so 175 metric tons, right? Um, thousand metric or tons. Or 1,000 metric tons. Is that, does that include, um, th that does not include the airport, is that right? What, what, what is included in, in that number? Well, I'm sorry, we've now moved to climate emergency right. updates. Right, I'll imagine that I'm gonna get an answer later. So I would, I would like to know, yeah, what, what is and is not, is not included. Um, another comment I was gonna make, and I wasn't necessarily gonna ask for a response on this. So that's good. I can, I guess, put it and file it under a climate emergency report. Um, I would have expected to hear probably a little bit more um, about how we were going to close some of these gaps. So you, you showed a bunch of gaps on all these um, these slides of where we're, we're, we're not on, on target. Um, you also listed a bunch of ways in which we, we might be able to do better. So on bill financing, um, new carbon you know impact fees. Um, but I didn't hear any estimates of you know, we think this is a home run. We think we're gonna see big movement um, on this particular graph. This data, you know, sh should get us, uh, we, we should get back on track and see a five, 10% movement in this particular area due to this particular policy. Um, it seems like a bunch of good ideas were just kind of thrown up there and listed, but that there wasn't necessarily the homework done, the numbers crunched to figure out how to get us back on track. Because we're not on track, obviously, and you know the accounting itself has been disputed. The goals themselves have been disputed by the public um, at, at, at length this evening. Um, I also heard you say that, uh, I, I think I heard you say that 95% of households use natural gas in Burlington. Um, and I wanted to follow up about what the, the current split is, because you also said, I think, that we're at um, 22, 2300, something like that, heat pumps installed. I know they're on the order of like 17,000 housing units in Burlington, so I wanted to get a better sense of, of where things stand. 95% uh, still using natural gas um, s seemed a little bit off from the back of the envelope cal calculations I had, I had done, um, and so I wanted to discuss that further with you, and I'll, I'll follow up offline. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Kane. 
Do any other counselors have a uh, climate emergency report? We're now on item six of our agenda. Okay. Um, somewhat unsurprising given that we just had the good discussion there. So again, thank you, General Manager Springer. Um, I think then that that would take us to item seven on our, on our agenda, which is uh, public health and safety emergency updates. Uh, Councillor Grant, I particularly appreciate your uh, providing documents which have been posted online in our uh, agenda with respect to this update. Um, am I correct in assuming that, that you have an update to provide here though to the council? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Turn to you first. I'm going to leave on my fellow councillors to talk about the reports. I'm going to slightly change what I was going to talk about because I feel the legislative update um, that we were discussing earlier there. I want to encourage everyone on the council to really review the document because there are some important updates related to a number of items that are working on some of our, of our most common public safety complaints. Um, for example, we know that we've had a huge increase in car thefts, not only in Burlington, but all across the state. And Vermont has a very weak statute with uh, regards to that. And so there is something that is in the works to help put a little bit more meat on that statute so that our police departments in Burlington and in the state can make better cases that can be, uh, well, not even better cases. In some cases, you can't, you, they can't be made so they don't get sent to the, um, the state's attorney's offices. Um, and then also the updates on funds that will be allocated to various forms of harm reduction uh, when it comes to battling the drug crisis. Uh, so I definitely encourage people to read through those items, uh, both residents and council members. Um, I am trying to get a more detailed update with um, our friends at Decker Towers. There is, after some additional patrols and security that was put in the building, things improved, but that really didn't last. So there's there's been some things kind of moving backwards that are concerning. So hopefully at the next meeting we'll have more details about that. There's been some agreement between the city, but there are questions as to when exactly the uh, the things that are listed in that agreement will be taking place. Um, so I'll save that for a later update. Um, there was a disappoint. One of the ways to get rid of drug dealers who are living in buildings, either Decker or any other buildings, is if they don't pay their rent, they can be evicted. It's a very long process, but they can be evicted in the absence of law enforcement. Well, we have a situation where... Um, there was dealers in the process of being evicted, and then they paid up their rent. So now we're back to an issue of a lack of law enforcement, and that once again is affecting the, um, the safety issues uh, within the community in that building. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Uh, Councillor Doherty. Thank you, uh, uh, President Travers. Um, I have two items that I wanted to bring to the council and the public's uh, attention. Uh, the first is a March 29th, 2024 uh, letter that was sent to the previous city council and our previous mayor. I don't know whether it has made it to the desks of, of our current mayor uh, or our current council, um, but I didn't want it to get lost in, in the shuffle uh, of reorganization day. Um, it's a letter from the law firm of McCormick, Fitzpatrick, Casper, and Burkard, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, which is on George Street, which is sort of kitty corner from the federal building. Um, it's a lengthy letter. Uh, I encourage us all to read it. I don't know that it made it into the agenda uh, of this. I don't believe it made it into the agenda of, of this city council meeting, um, but it is. it should be publicly available since it was uh, sent to all of us uh, and to the outgoing mayor. Uh, it is, ex is uh, remarkable in that it is essentially uh, a year-long um, listing uh, of the criminal activity uh, that this business uh, has been subjected to. Um, they kept meticulous method uh, records, um, crimes, you know, 
ranging from uh, threats, you know, assault type behavior, uh, vandalism, um, uh, running the gamut to just, you know, garbage, needles, uh, things like that. Um, really an extensive uh, record and I think emblematic uh, of what many, unfortunately, businesses uh, have been suffering uh, downtown. Uh, they end with a request for us uh, and for uh, the outgoing mayor, or the, the outgoing mayor, which I'm sure um, extends to all of us, um, that they would like a continuous, uh, significant, consistent, uh, and immediate police presence uh, in the George Street and Elmwood Avenue uh, area. So I didn't want that uh, message to us uh, from a, a downtown business to be lost in the shuffle. Uh, similarly, I think we've all uh, received communications from Alan Caruso, uh, who runs the Thorn and Roots uh, restaurant, which was vandalized the other night uh, by someone throwing uh, uh, something through uh, their front plate glass uh, window. I think that is a similar, uh, in the similar vein, um, and I wanted to make sure that the public was aware of these uh, incidents and these communications from our constituents uh, as we move forward and, and address public safety. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Is there any other council? Councillor Barlow? Uh, thank you, President Travers. And my update was uh, the second update that um, Councillor Doherty uh, just mentioned. But um, this was a, a random but violent act in our downtown this weekend. Um, and with the warming weather, we can anticipate an increased frequency of people acting in ways that are in conflict with a safe and welcoming downtown for diners, uh, shoppers and tourists. And I just want to acknowledge that we need to do a better job um, supporting our business community during this public health and safety emergency. They're at the front lines of the mayhem we've been experiencing downtown these last couple of years. And it's critical that we get in front of this situation before it worsens with a clear plan for patrolling the streets, challenging antisocial behaviors, and enforcing our rules. We can't have another summer like uh, the ones we've had these past two. Um, we also need to find a better way of supporting businesses when harm is done through vandalism, theft, and trespass. And I'm hoping and hopeful that this will be um, a top priority for this council um, and for the administration. Thanks. Thanks, Councilor Barlow. Councilor Newbezer. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Council President. Um, I just wanted to highlight there's four reports uh, on this agenda item online, um, and I believe because of the work of Councilor Grant, uh, chairing public safety that these reports will now regularly be accessible to the public. It's the chief's report, um, the fire department April commission report, the fire chief's commission report, police chief's commission report, which, which I just mentioned, and then the Burlington fire uh, department response data, all really helpful. And I'm hoping there's a few sort of ways that we're presenting data that I'm hoping to work with chief Murad so that we can just all have a shared understanding both in the community and on this council about what the reality uh, is on the ground and what the data is telling us um, so that it can better inform our policy decisions as it re uh, relates to public safety. But I know that as an individual, even in this role and someone who's been involved for eight years, uh, <laughs> I was trying to get this at, at this with BED, but uh, navigating information given by the city to the public is often hard. And so I think we need to be really thoughtful and work really hard um, I'm hoping to work with our, with our new mayor to make sure that we all have a shared understanding of, of what the facts actually are. Um, I'll just mention too, I just wanted to highlight, and I know we'll talk about it later in the agenda, the fact that overdoses are down, it was mentioned in public comment, um, is extremely heartening to me. I think it shows that uh, data-informed practices uh, like the CRT program that the fire department stood up are working, uh, and we ought to be doubling down and pursuing those strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Newbezer. Yes, Councilor Grant. I just wanted to remind everyone that um, our public safety committee meeting is this Thursday evening at six o'clock, and it is posted in Civic Clerk for anyone who would like to attend, and it will be a virtual meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Mulvaney Stanek. Thank you, President Travers. Um, I wanted to just offer to this conversation, and it's my first time being able to participate on this particular topic, but to really also name the hard work that our Burlington Community Justice Center has been doing as we talk about um, public health and safety issues. 
Uh, I really want to appreciate one of the counselors just mentioned um, that what happened on Thorn uh, to the Thorn and Roots. Uh, business, they've already been reaching out to those folks. There, when harm happens, there's the immediate response, of course, that we expect from our emergency responders. But an important second piece needs to be utilizing all of our resources, and including our community justice center. And so I've been working to make sure that we elevate and notify and bridge that gap that's been happening between the incident of harm and then the victims. Another example I want to name that's happened, unfortunately, in the first two weeks of my administration um, is the arson uh, attempt at uh, uh, U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders' office. Again, really commend the emergency response. This is another part around the um, increased um, targeting of elected folks that is happening in our climate right now that I consider also part of public health and safety in our community. Uh, again, connecting Community Justice Center to Bernie's staff because there were folks who were in that office who were unable to immediately leave with that, that incident. So I just want to name that and I hope this gets rounded out in our conversations as we continue to work collaboratively on finding and getting to the root causes while not forgetting the victims of, um, who, of and the uh, ongoing care and connections that we can offer to folks who are experiencing harm in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Anyone else with a uh, public health and safety emergency update? Then we will go ahead and close this item, uh, which takes us to item eight, our consent agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated on civic clerk? Thank you, Councilor Shannon. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilor Newbeezer. Uh, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. Uh, we now turn to our deliberative agenda. There are five items on our deliberative agenda this evening. Uh, the first item is item 9.1, a resolution authorizing uh, refinancing City of Burlington's uh, general obligation waterfront tax increment note, series 2023. Uh, on this issue, glad to be joined by CETO Director Brian Pine and David White from White & Burke. Uh, the floor is yours, Director Pine. Thank you. Just for the record, I'm Brian Pine, the Director of the Community and Economic Development Office with you tonight to talk about the refinancing of the waterfront TIF notes. And I'm gonna make a few brief remarks, I promise. Um, I know that TIF sometimes causes folks to look at their phone and do other things, but just bear with us, because this is important. So the city has the waterfront TIF district debt which is uh, in the form of a note as opposed to a bond. It's $18,840,000. Um, the development agreement, often called the ARDA, which is the Amended Restated Development Agreement 2.0, um, is it obligates us to refinance this note uh, because those dollars are needed for the public improvements and um, the way the state law requires municipalities to conduct their borrowing by a certain date, and we met that date last summer. So that money has been borrowed and essentially placed in an account, and um, uh, luckily for the city, that account generated more interest than the cost of the borrowing, and so there's a net positive uh, arbitrage, which doesn't always happen, and um, when there's no guarantee that will happen going forward, but um, David will talk a little bit more about that. So it matures at the end of May, uh, the existing note, and the idea with refinancing it is to go back out to the market through a request for proposals to see what the, the best uh, rate and term the city can get. Uh, the, the, the plan being to uh, buy the city more time to ensure that the financing is available uh, should it be needed, but in fact it's going to be turned into or converted to uh, a bond which is essentially using bond dollars to pay off the note. So it's taking on permanent financing to take out this, this is interim financing, this note. Um, we have a few key variables that aren't, we not, not known yet. We don't actually know the entire development program, if you will, of the, of the whole City Place project. Um, and if we don't know that, we can't know for sure what's the right amount to borrow. So we wanna make sure that we're right sizing the borrowing and not borrowing more than is needed. And so until we know the exact uh, program for the remainder of the project, which is that north portion, sort of over the Cherry Street, St. Paul, down to Pine, um, we also don't know the pricing for the public improvements. That will be known um, in the coming months. 
Um, but until we know that as well, we don't. We, we need to right size the borrowing to fit that. Uh, I just want to mention there's no risk, there's no cost to taxpayers in this refinancing. We have um, safeguards in place, and, and namely the fact that it's a project note uh, means that we can repay it and prepay it at any time. So that is a very, um, you know, that's an important protection. Uh, we also have other protections built into the ARTA 2.0. Um, I would just say we're lucky because I feel we're lucky to have um, David White as our consultant. And David is with us tonight to talk a little bit about TIF. We're going to do TIF 101, I think 201, and maybe even 301. So we're going to be quick, but we've got to go through some basic slides here, which I think we're going to get some help on. So, David, do you want to make a few comments before? Sure. So um, it's, it's, in, it's in the packet. It's there. Thank you all. Um, for the record, uh, my name is David White. I'm president of White and Burke Real Estate Advisors, and we um, uh, are, have been involved in tax increment financing, shorthand is TIF. Um, throughout the state, we are among the active TIF districts. There's only one that we didn't either set up or are currently consulting on. So we're very intimately familiar with how TIF works and so forth, and our role is very much on in the front end, getting TIF districts set up um, and uh, getting all the approvals that are necessary for that, doing the planning and financial projections and helping negotiate the agreements between municipalities and the developers who come in to uh, ensure that municipalities are well protected in the way these things are done. We're not actually involved in the administration, if you will, of it. Uh, the city of Burlington has another firm called MuniCap that works and assists the city with administration of the, the TIF districts that it has. But we have been involved with both the Waterfront TIF district, which is uh, the topic this evening, but also with, we were, have been involved from the very beginning, we uh, were the consultants involved with setting up the downtown TIF district. So with that said, I'd love it uh, if we can get the um, slides up and I'll talk about it. Um, so the topic tonight does have to do with uh, debt refinancing for the TIF district. Um, the, uh, I don't know if we can go full screen on that. There's probably a way to do that. There we go, thank you. Um, let's go, but I'm gonna quickly, let's go to the next slide. Um, the, uh, so tonight I'm gonna talk about what is TIF and how does it work? For those of you particularly who are new to the council, may not be familiar with it, and TIF is complicated and takes some time to become comfortable and used to how these things work. So I'm gonna give you an overview of that, then talk a little bit about the Waterfront TIF District specifically, um, and talk a little bit about the agreement we have with the developers, City Place Partners, um, the overall finances of the Waterfront TIF District, and then this specific financing, refinancing, um, that we need to do. And then uh, certainly an uh, opportunity for questions and answers. Let's move on. Um, so first it's important to understand that Burlington actually has two TIF districts. Um, the, there's the waterfront TIF district, which is the subject tonight, which is along the waterfront and then extends up roughly between Bank Streets and, and Cherry Street up to Church Street. So it's T-shaped. Um, and then there's uh, the downtown TIF district, which is shaded in blue here, that kind of wraps around that area. And they are different. They were set up at different times. There are su subtly different rules around each because of their different time frames. Um, but tonight, we're talking about the downtown TIF district specifically. So just to be clear about that. Um, excuse me. I apologize. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the waterfront TIF district tonight. Thank you for, uh, for correcting me on that. Uh, so tonight's the Waterfront TIF District, so if we can move on. Um, so how does it work? So with TIF District, what happens is that you first establish um, through in the TIF District and define a geographic area. And it's a very specific one where there, you, know, you draw a map and there are certain properties that are in the TIF District and others that are outside. And within the TIF district, what you're trying to do is to incentivize new development. So it's, a, it's an economic development tool. In fact, I would tell you, I believe this to be the most powerful economic tool available in the, in the state of Vermont. 
and that it's grossly underutilized in terms of its potential to help stimulate the kinds of dev development we're looking for because it's very focused in downtowns and places like that where the state through its planning process would like to see this happen. And so you set up a TIF district, geographic boundaries are established and the idea is that a municipality borrows money to invest in infrastructure that makes possible projects that could not or would not otherwise occur. And that could be parking, that could be um, utility improvements, it could be streetscape improvements, those kinds of investments that make the site feasible for a project that might not otherwise occur. Once that happens, then the, you take, at the time the TIF district is established, you um, determine what is the value, the assessed value, the grand list of all the properties in that district on the day it's established, or the year it's established. That's what's called the original taxable value, or OTV. And as new development occurs in the district, the incremental values above that are used, the taxes from those incremental values, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment because there's some subtleties to it, but it's the incremental taxes only above the prior uh, values that go toward paying the debt service on the debt the municipality incurred to pay for the infrastructure improvements. And that's important because what it means is we're not taking any taxes away from where they're going today. We're not taking, we're not costing existing taxpayers anything because we're not putting more burden on the existing grand list, whether it's for the general fund or the state's education fund. So it's only the incremental, and that's where the tax increment financing comes in because you're using the newly generated uh, taxes to pay the debt service. So that's a critical element here. Um, so ultimately what happens is the municipality borrows money, does the infrastructure improvements, the private sector does its private development, that creates new taxable value that generates new revenue, which then in turn pays the debt service. And what's important as you put these things together is to make sure that you've aligned the, the amount of debt that a municipality is taking on, its commitments in terms of what it's going to pay for in infrastructure with the amount of new tax revenue that is going to be derived. And uh, a key subtlety here, and then we'll move on, is that it's not if we build it, they will come. You don't just spend the money and cross your fingers and hope. No, you enter into development agreements that are contractually binding commitments that says, okay, to the development company, in this case, City Place Partners is the key one we're talking about. If you contractually commit to doing this work and you reach certain thresholds, we, the municipality, are contractually committed to doing the supportive public infrastructure that will help enable your project to move forward. So each party is bound to the other. It's not wishful thinking. And the way the development agreement is set up is the city does not have to actually incur, it doesn't have to commit to the long-term debt until various thresholds are met. So let's move on. So um, in terms of this, this is, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but it varies from TIF district to TIF district. In the case of Burlington's TIF district, this is about education taxes because one of the critical elements here is that we're retaining not just municipal taxes, but also the education taxes that otherwise go to the state. So we're using some of those taxes uh, to help pay the debt service. And in the, um, the portion of the waterfront TIF district that we're talking about, 75% of the edu new education incremental taxes that are being generated go into the TIF fund to pay debt service. 25% go to the state to the education fund. So the state's gaining 25% of the taxes that, um, uh, that it would uh, otherwise have gotten, it's getting. The 75% though goes into the TIF district. In the case of municipal taxes in the Waterfront TIF District, 100% of the incremental municipal taxes go into the TIF fund. So we've got 75% of the education taxes, 100% of the municipal taxes. What's critical though is at the end of the life of the TIF District, you've paid off the debt and all those taxes that had been going to the TIF fund now are available to pay other costs. They'll go to the education fund, they'll go to the general fund. 
And so you start to get those revenues. And that's a key element here that you're really investing in your own community's uh, economic future. Let's move on. So the Waterfront TIF District, very quickly, it was established in 1996. Originally, it was only along the waterfront, uh, kind of west of Battery Street. But then it was a few years later expanded to have this T element along uh, Cherry and Bank Streets up to um, uh, Church Street in order to incentivize and enable some of the developments that have occurred along that area, including the, the what was then Filene's Macy's Building, uh, that's now the high school, and the uh, Hotel Vermont, and the Marriott, and so forth. And TIF paid for some critical infrastructure to support those projects. Importantly, and this is going to be important for you folks to know, is that most of the TIF district expires at the end of next fiscal year. We're currently in FY24. At the end of FY25, the, the, most of the TIF district expires. The only pieces left are three par properties that the legislature um, extended the life of those to 2035, an additional decade. Those three properties are the ones that encompass the former um, mall, uh, Burlington Square Mall or Burlington Town Center, except for the Macy's Fi Filene's building. It does not include that portion, but it includes what's under construction today for City Place. It also includes that portion that is so-called phase two that still fronts on Church Street. Those three properties only, you can think of it as kind of a mini tip, it's a subset, have an additional 10 year life. And that's really what we're talking about here. But in uh, another year or 18 months or so, less than 18 months, you're gonna suddenly start to see additional uh, money that had been going to the TIF district will start to be available to the general fund and similarly funds to the education fund. Let's move on. So the Waterfront TIF district has done a wide range of, of projects over, the, over its life. I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but most of the improvements you've seen along the waterfront over uh, the decades since then have been paid for at least in part, if not wholly through TIF. That includes much of the bike path, the Lake Street upgrades, the, both the Westlake and Lakeside garages that were critical to that, uh, the, uh, what happened with the Hotel Vermont and so forth. Um, the fishing pier, the Moran frame, those are all TIF projects. Let's move on. Um, so City Place, talk about that for just a moment because that's the core of what we're doing here. So there is a development agreement which Brian referred to, the, uh, the, the ARDA, the Amended and Restated Development Agreement 2.0. Um, and there are some critical pieces. It's a complicated agreement. There are a lot of elements in it. But for tonight's purposes, some of the key things to understand are first, that in, in the development agreement, the city gained ownership of the Pine Street and St. Paul Street rights of way that are necessary for reconnecting those streets that got bifurcated uh, several decades ago at no cost to the city. The developer who owned them had no obligation to give those to the city, but we, the city negotiated a deal where those were provided at no cost. The city didn't have to pay for them. In exchange, though, for that and for the helping incentivize the project, the city's paying for the infrastructure to build the streets that will go on those rights of way. So that's a municipal cost, and that's a key piece of what TIF is paying for. In fact, the core of what TIF is paying for is the recreation of St. Paul and Pine Streets. But as I described with the way TIF works in general, the incremental property taxes from City Place itself and right now we're talking about just phase one, which is the south building, which you're seeing up today with all the yellow board on it, and the north building facing on Cherry Street, the foundation of which is underway, the rest of the building is not yet vertically up. The incremental taxes from those two buildings alone, not including so-called phase two, which fronts on Cherry, uh, excuse me, Church Street, those, the incremental taxes from those are what are going to pay the debt service. And the contract, the agreement with the developer says, we're not gonna borrow any more money, ultimately, than your taxes are enough to pay off. And if your project's not gonna pay enough taxes to pay that debt, we're not gonna borrow that much. You still have to build the streets. You're just not gonna get reimbursed as much money for building the streets. So there's a lot of protection for the city in the way this agreement is written. We get the streets regardless if they generate enough taxes for us to support the debt to pay the full cost, the city is obligated to pay it. So there's a real 
uh, trade-off and, and uh, strong agreement. And there are a lot of other uh, protections for the city included in that agreement. Let's move on. So this is the, an image, for those who may not have seen it, of the South Building uh, that's underway. So the masonry is beginning to go up as, uh, already, uh, currently, and ultimately it's going to be like the, the building you see in the white stone here. You can see this is an image from the corner of St. Paul and Bank looking um, north along St. Paul, and the northern building is showing in the red there. Let's move on. Just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So, with this, what, what's the city committed to do here? Just so you understand the context. Um, originally, the agreement was purely that the city was going to pay for using TIF, again, subject to there being enough uh, tax, incremental tax revenue to pay the debt service, this reconnection of Pine and St. Paul Streets, and then also some upgrades along Cherry and Bank abutting the project itself. But TIF, and this is a critical piece here as well, the fact that the city is putting up this 18 million or whatever the final number turns out to be, it'll be 18 million 840 or less, it's not gonna be more than that, um, allowed the, uh, the city to obtain other funds. So it's gotten two major grants. One is $12 million con congressionally directed spending that Leahy did, Senator Leahy did shortly before he retired that will help uh, pay for major reconstruction along Cherry Street all the way from Battery up to South Winooski Avenue. And then also um, a, what's called a raise grant, which is through the uh, Federal Transportation Administration, $22 million for a total of $34 million in federal grants that have been leveraged because of the city's willingness to do its investment here. In addition to that, there's another roughly million and a half the city has obtained through um, the uh, uh, sales tax reallocation program the state of Vermont has. So uh, substantial additional dollars. And what this has enabled is from the original project, which was just Paul, uh, Pine and St. Paul, to actually do much, much more, which is now what I described on Cherry Street, the entire length, and then also Bank Street from Pine to uh, South Winooski Avenue. And all of those will be done to the Great Street standard. So this is a huge upgrade to downtown that TIF has made possible. Let's move on. If at all possible, David, to turn specifically We're soon here to, to the question. To okay. There. This is a quick Great. image. Thank you. Um, um, so this is a quick image of, uh, of uh, Bank Street. Let's move on of what we're anticipating. Uh, this talks a little bit more about the details of the dollars that for, are from the various sources and where they come from and go to. Um, but it's a total of $54 million, of which 18840 at most is going to be out of TIF. The rest of it are from other sources. Let's move on. Um, very, in the downtown waterfront TIF district, the original taxable value back when it was established in 1996 was about $42 million. We're currently at $151 million. It's been incredibly successful in terms of generating value. Incremental value to date is about $109 million. The estimate for City Place Phase 1, which is under construction today, is an additional $115 million in incremental value. And we a rough, very rough estimate, because we don't know enough about it yet for phase two, that portion which is not yet under construction, fronting on uh, Church Street is an additional 60 million. Let's move on. Um, so in terms of taxes and debt, at the end of next fiscal year, so 15 months from now, whatever it is, um, when most of the district ends, there's roughly $800,000 a year that's currently going to the TIF fund that will go to the um, will go into the general fund. Those additional funds will be available to address other expenses and costs and challenges the city faces. In addition to that, by that time, all the older debt will be paid off other than one final payment on a very small piece, a HUD 108 loan that'll get paid the following fiscal year. It's less than $200,000 in debt service that final year. But the debt will have been paid off for everything else the city has done up till now through, um, through TIF, incremental taxes. 10 years uh, for the, uh, at the end of, uh, 10 years later, at the end of FY35, the uh, extension on these final three parcels were end, and we estimate that it's gonna add 10 years after about additional $1.4 million to the city's general fund at that stage of the game to be available for other purposes. And those estimates don't even include uh, what will be going to the education fund. The state gets even more because there's a larger portion of this currently from the education fund. Let's move on. So refinancing. 
to get to the final point. So the debt that we're talking about is 18,840,000. It's a one-year note that uh, matures at the end of May. Um, we need to be going out with an RFP to the um, funding sources in the near term in order to be able to refinance it by that time. Um, so we're proposing to refinance it for a second year and then ultimately do a long-term bond. Now, this may not be the final time it's refinanced. We're hopeful that a year from now we'll be ready to go to a permanent bond, but we don't know for certain. It depends on whether we know definitively at that point or sufficiently definitively what the incremental values are for City Place. We expect we will. Um, if we have all the construction pricing we need for all the improvements, the public improvements, and thus we know how much of the debt we really need, uh, so the first one is about how much we can afford. The second one is how much we need. And finally, have, have the, has the interest rate environment improved enough, or do we think it's going to improve more and thus be beneficial to extend? So those are the th three key variables that we're uh, waiting on. But in the meantime, uh, we're advising that we proceed uh, to refinance for another one-year note. I think that's it. I think the next one is a picture with Q&A. Perfect. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, I'm about to turn to you in a moment for a motion. I'll note that um, uh, this matter does come before the Council with the unanimous support of the Board of Finance. Um, I appreciate the broader presentation here to the new Council with respect to these uh, TIF districts. I know, Director Pine, you'd reached out beforehand to ask for a bit more time there for the presentation, so even though that beep went off some time ago, uh, we'll, we'll provide some time now here uh, for, for Councillor questions, but Councillor Carpenter, could I turn to you first with a motion? Sure, thank you. Um, I would move that uh, 9.1 resolution, the resolution with the authorization for refinancing the City of Burlington's 18,840,000 um, 18, general obligation waterfront tax increment note series 2023. Um, that we waive the reading of that resolution and adopt it. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Is there a second on that motion? Second. Okay, thank you, Councillor Grant. Um, Councillor Carpenter, did you wish for the floor back after that? No. Or Okay. Um, are there any councillors with questions or comments on this item? Councillor Grant. Not really a question, but just a, a kind of statement of concern um, with the audits. And I know we had a not great audit, and then we, the city brought in consultant, and then we had another audit with some, some questions on it. So just as we approach getting to the point where the districts will no longer exist, that we make it out in one piece with regards to the audits of these uh, these monies. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Grant. Any other questions or comments from councilors? All right. Uh, well, again, I appreciate the detailed presentation. Uh, before we close out the item, we do need to go to a vote on Councilor Carpenter's motion. Uh, the motion is to waive the reading and adopt the resolution. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and I would just offer if there's any counselor who has questions about TIF and how it works, feel free to be in touch. Happy to chat. It's a complicated subject. Perfect. I appreciate your being here. We could have a fun with TIF um, introductory <laughs> yeah. presentation. You just had it. Um, so our, our next two items here are 9.2 and 9.3. 9.2 is with respect to the Winooski Bridge Finance and Maintenance Agreement. 9.3 is with respect to the Colchester Riverside Barrett Mill Intersection Finance and Maintenance Agreement. There is some uh, overlap here. And so uh, DPW Director Chapin Spencer, I would turn to you to uh, introduce your team here and, and hopefully provide the council presentation that perhaps covers both of these items. Yes, thank you. Uh, for the record, Chapin Spencer, Director of Public Works. I'm joined uh, by Senior Public Works Engineer Laura Wheelock and Public Works Engineer Maddie Swender. So uh, tonight you have two related generational investments in front of you. 
and request to approve their finance and maintenance agreements with our state and federal partners. After years of advocacy at the Burlington, uh, in all levels of Burlington, I'm pleased to report there's strong alignment among our partners to advance these two projects. And while in particular the Winooski Burlington Bridge is owned 50 50 by our state, excuse me, by uh, Winooski and Burlington, and the state and federal partners could uh, say that it is our responsibility only to make these investments, I'm pleased to report that both the feds and the state are prepared to fund the majority of both of these projects. <laughs> For without their participation, there would be no viable way for our two communities to move forward. Winooski is moving quickly. They've already approved a bond for their local share of the project. And tonight, they are also voting on the finance and maintenance agreement between them and the state of Vermont. I will lastly say that we are committed to the ongoing engagement with our stakeholders as the design of these projects uh, is refined. We know in particular there's been discussion around bike and pedestrian accommodation. There's also been conversation around construction impacts for adjacent stakeholders. You'll see tonight in a uh, presentation that the modified uh, design that we are exploring uh, will reflect uh, the, the, the uh, effort to engage stakeholders and modify the design accordingly. With that, I'll turn it over to the project team to give a quick overview of where we are at. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna just go through some, a very abbreviated version of a public presentation that was given in January of this year. Uh, it also shows the updated cross-section uh, that Director Spencer mentioned. So for orientation's sake, uh, the project includes both the replacement of the Winooski Bridge as well as reconfiguration of the Colchester Barrett intersection with Riverside, um, highlighting those out. The uh, two projects are federally separate. They have different project numbers, hence the reason why there are two different agreements in front of you tonight. The bridge has a more certain timeline. The raise grant funding that the two communities applied for with the state has a time certain start of construction obligation funding of June of 2026 and a total completion of the project um, by 2030. So that one has a little bit more of a constraint. The intersection is not as time constrained, but recognizing uh, constructing them separately uh, in sequence, one after another would be really challenging for both communities, so we're pushing to do them both on the same timeline. So what's happened to date? So VTRAN's procurity consultant in the spring of last year, from that point in time, with the uh, relatively short funding obligation for a federalized project and a project of this scale, we kicked off with some community meetings, some surveys, uh, local outreach, visiting, uh, different pop-up opportunities with uh, farmers markets and other events that happened within the city of Winooski, uh, Burlington Farmers Market, and uh, the little zip code survey shows the different communities and the volume of response we've had from different communities. And then this is the focus of the things that we've received with the different size of the letters highlighting um, the more popular times that it's been uh, noted in our outreach. So to back up just a little bit, it's important to recognize, you know, federal projects are slow projects. Uh, this essentially started back in 2017. Both the intersection and the bridge received uh, an opportunity from the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission to be scoped. And really what that does is it asks to look at different opportunities and different ways in which um, a project's goals can be met. The intersection and the bridge um, proceeded through some robust public outreach, community groups, stakeholder groups, and ultimately through the city council early in 2019. After receiving those uh, approvals of a preferred alternative, DPW has been working to find different funding for them. Um, that includes in 2021, where we applied to the state to have the intersection be reconfigured, and in 2022, submitted the raise grant application. Ironically, the award of those came almost at the same time in August of 2022. 
from that point. We've moved fairly quickly with our state uh, community partners and putting out uh, updated conceptual plans for the bridge itself. Uh, the intersection is lagging behind, and you'll see in just a few minutes uh, why those why that is. But we are essentially early in 2024. We're looking to start heading into our federal permitting, uh, and ultimately by 2026, soliciting contractors. So this is going to be a design build project. It's not how the city has often done our projects. When we go for a contractor, we're going to be about 60% design. It's going to be asking the contractor and an engineer that they are hiring to finish the plans to 100%. So when we go for bid, we'll still have more work to do. When we select this contractor is when we will know all of the final choices, which are, it's hard to do it now. It's, it's still a little bit up in the air because they will submit a proposal to us that will say, these are the things that we will do and this is the cost we will do them for. So. The bridge itself, what we have committed to uh, already with the raise grant application is a complete replacement. It is providing separated bike ped uh, facilities from the vehicles and it is maintaining four lanes of travel. And this is what's in our raise grant application and these are the, the fundamentals as to what the concept is bounded by. I apologize, the, the graphic is hard to read but it is part of the council's packet if you needed to uh, open up the PDF to zoom in. So the top image is our existing structure. It's 57 feet out to out. The proposed structure inside of the scoping study is a 76 foot wide bridge, which has four travel lanes and two 12 foot shared use paths. And then the lower image, which is something that we've been working on with some of our bike ped groups, both within the city of Burlington and Winooski, is uh, an alternate that allocates a little bit more space to the western side of the bridge, which is the downstream side to create um, a better entrance from the riverside path and then looking at whether or not we can take that from the upstream uh, side of the bridge or um, what other alternates exist there. So that is what's still currently in study. One of the things that is highly challenged with this area is just the limited amount of space. You know, we have buildings on the Burlington side, we have a dam on the Burlington side, and those are some pretty significant constraints. This would not be a great project if we had to remove either. So in addition to the width, we also have to look at what the alignment looks like. The scoping study and our, our bridge that we have out there now is the straight version that is on the left. However, as we've taken a closer look at the structure, its constructability, the amount of traffic in, that is being passed on it each day, the consultants have looked at the curved or shifted alignment, um, which provides a couple of other benefits that uh, we hadn't even realized until they started looking at it. It provides some natural traffic calming, which is one of the things that we've heard from a lot of our community members who walk across this bridge, is the straightness uh, per increases perception of the speed that people can travel. This shift alignment would also potentially allow for a path underneath the structure on the Burlington side, similar to what the city of Winooski has. So then to move quickly over to the intersection, and this is the reason why it lags behind, until we have a better idea about the bridge's alignment, it's challenging to align the intersection. Both of these would still be signalized intersections. The one on the left is the one from the scoping study. The one on the right is one that uh, more straightly aligns US Route 7 actually uh, with Riverside and creating that as more of a straight path, which is the predominant traffic direction uh, and leaving Colchester Ave and Barrett to come in as side streets. So what is the intersection working to do? Um, we are headed towards an intersection focused meeting. We've had a lot of bridge focused meetings, but we need to start having a couple of meetings with our community to talk about where the intersection is, as well as some of the choices that we can make uh, in advancing it. But really, we are looking to maximize safety, focusing on all of our roadway users, um, but recognizing that we do still need to maintain it as a class one highway to pass the truck traffic uh, in a way that is calmer than it exists today. So what are we gonna continue to do next? There's still a lot of outreach planned, both around the bridge and the intersection. Um, the bridge's next choices are coming up with its aesthetics related to the railing, related to lighting, 
uh, intersection has base needs to start from the very beginning. But again, all of this is really still looking at bike ped safety and mobility and those types of refinements that we can make headed into permitting. And that's what I have for the update on that. All right. Thank you very much for those presentations. I appreciate that. Uh, is a question that will be coming back before the council in terms of uh, the, the design and, and construction, um, but thought this was nonetheless a, a great opportunity to introduce this generational project to the new council. Um, just as with 9.1, 9.2, and 9.3 uh, do come before this council with the unanimous support of the Board of Finance, I uh, would like to now turn to councilors to see uh, who has any questions or comments on this item. Uh, Councillor Newbeezer, Kane, okay, Grant, uh, Doherty, McKnight. Um, so we'll start with you, Councillor Newbeezer. Yeah, thank you so much. And sorry not to, um, I have a few questions. I have raised them to, to Chapin of Four in general, but I, I should have, uh, I'm learning my council etiquette. I should have emailed you in advance. Um, so I understand this doesn't, the decision we're making tonight doesn't lock us into a specific design, just to be very, very clear with folks, particularly in Ward 1, who are concerned about this. Um, and I'm seeing nods, so. Yeah, we can put that on record. That is correct. Um, it does not obligate us to an alternative uh, as it relates to exact dimensions, but it does still require and keep the commitments that this council, that the council has made um, to both projects. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I, I will just say, and I, I guess I wonder if maybe briefly you can explain the number one thing I've heard, I didn't see it on the on the chart, I was surprised. The number one thing I've heard from constituents is the desire for a roundabout, um, even if it's a single lane. Um, I don't tend to be a street design expert, um, but <laughs> yeah, I've heard a lot of folks say the South End get a roundabout, we want a roundabout in Ward 1. So I'm wondering if you could just briefly give folks context to that, because that's the thing that I keep hearing. Yep, um, so this consultant team has also reviewed a roundabout alternative and it still is functionally not feasible to install a roundabout in this location. The number of vehicles per day is double what the current Shelburne Street roundabout is seeing. Um, it is more than a single lane roundabout can pass. Geometrically, it doesn't fit without extending out over the river and interfering with the dam, which provides a whole host of federal regulations that I have not ever crossed and am very intimidated by. But we do have more information um, that the team is packaging to be publicly outward facing. Um, and I've also heard from several Ward 1 residents that are just looking for a better understanding on that. Yeah, and then just a brief comment, I guess, out of those three designs, and I know we're not having a conversation on design, but I do just want to note as early in the process, um, you know, like we have that Main Street uh, crossing with a bunch of UVM students. Increasingly, uh, there's that building in Winooski right over the bridge there where a lot of college students are, are populating, a significant number of UVM students increasingly. Um, and so I think we already have a lot of folks who are probably un uh, are, are getting across the bridge, but it's, it's not particularly safe, it's not particularly comfortable. So really having those separated lanes, and I think I've heard from public work folks, uh, public works folks, uh, during our onboarding that there's potential challenges when you have separated bike lanes um, in terms of like snow plowing, et cetera. But I do think that the, the benefits are really huge. And not only is that already a main corridor for travel, um, but I think it's increasingly going to be, particularly with students who don't necessarily have cars. So we're gonna see a lot more foot traffic, bike traffic, et cetera. Um, so just wanna note that and I'll uh, pass it on. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Kane. Thanks for the presentation. I have a few questions. Uh, so first, the bridge would need to be widened from 76 to 77 uh, uh, to get the 15 feet on one side with the five feet for uh, bike lanes in each direction. Uh, I just wanna clarify what is the process for getting that extra foot and how likely is it to happen? And how much you know additional funding, would there be a separate funding measure involved for that that we're not looking at right now? Um. VTrans is also supportive of the 77, and so really they're just looking to make sure geometrically and permitting-wise that they it, it'll still fit. Um, we're feeling pretty comfortable that we'll get to that point, but they're still they're still checking before we can say fully yes. 
for funding. Uh, because VTrans is supportive, it will still follow the same funding split, 80% uh, federal, 10% state, and then 5% to each community. Um, one of the things we are constrained by is even though they are supportive of this alternative, mass widening of the bridge really comes at about a $300,000 to $500,000 per foot cost. Um, so it does still come at a cost to us and to the project to be able to widen it that one foot. Thank you. Um, next question is in relation to the financing. If we move forward tonight with, with this, this aspect of the financing, um, we, we ultimately do need to approve the, the design. Um, so say that we don't approve of the design in the end. Um, would we be on the hook then for project development costs like over the time in between now and then? There's some interesting clauses in this finance and maintenance agreement um, about ways that we get out of it and ways that we can't, depending on cost. Um, one of them hooks with a, a community bond vote that's failing, um, and then we don't have to repay anything. But ultimately, if we don't come to resolution on the base technical concept, um, I'd have to go and refer back to the, the document. It does address that, but I don't remember what specifics or if there's a percent we pay. Okay, I can follow up separately on that. And then you mentioned that there are some specific commitments that have been made, like in the grant application. So like four lanes is, is happening. Like there's nothing that's gonna, that, that cannot change, right? So I just wanna clarify a little bit, you know, what can and cannot change. So is a circle, a single lane circle, like ruled out that would like violate the, the grant proposal? Like it's just not possible. Yep, the bridge and the intersection are different. Right. The bridge is the only one that has the grant. The intersection is 100% federally funded, funded through the safety program. Um, however, the council in May of 2023 confirmed the signalized alternative, and that is how we submitted a document with a letter of intent to VTrans. So we would jeopardize the funding if we tried to get a circle. Okay. Yep. And then um, lane width, though, like would not be a violation, like if we said the lanes are 10 and a half and that's just it, like we would not jeopardize our funding. Um, mostly. So the communities can request a 10 and a half foot lane. It is in a, it's a waiver of a federal standard. Uh, both communities have expressed openness to going to 10 and a half, but only on the straight alignment. And that's because of vehicle tracking on the curved alignment would overlap lanes and then overlap where people are next to them. So that's one of those ones that I was trying to highlight. We can have preferences, but we won't know until we see the contractor's proposal, if they choose the straight bridge, if they choose a curved bridge, which one we accept as to the two communities which direction we can go with that choice. So we can't make the 10 and a half to 11 foot lane choice until 2026. But we're gonna investigate it that it is the wider 11 foot lanes, it's the more conservative approach to take during permitting. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kane, Councilor Grant. Thank you, um, Councilor Kane asked a lot of my questions. Um, so the only one uh, left was, so we, what will the process be? And if you don't know exactly what it will be now, but just to make sure we're in the loop in terms of being notified when the contractor is selected and then the contractor comes forward with a design um, just to make sure that we have council and public input um, before we say yes or yes or no. Um, based on what you've just said, obviously there's some limitations because we don't want to endanger the funding that we have, but uh, still this is a really important uh, project to people. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Uh, we have Councillor Doherty and then Councillor McKnight. Thank you, President Travers. Uh, Councillor Newbezer asked my question about the rotary. Um, I would just reiterate, which you know, and, and ask you to do what you just said you were going to do, which is as part of your community outreach program, you know, really lay out with specificity for folks why a rotary is not not physically possible in this location, because there's a, a lot of people really interested in that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. Councillor McKnight. Thank you, President Travers. Um, 
And thanks to the other counselors, uh, you asked many of my questions already, but I wanted to get a little bit more specific on when people can expect to see the next version of the plan. Um, can you just say that out loud, even if you already said it? Because I think it's really important. Um, relative to the bridge or the intersection? The bridge. We have a design team meeting Thursday where we're discussing um, what they've been finding. The widening conversation happened late March, and so they've been working for the last three weeks to kind of double check what we talked about with our walking, biking uh, focus group meeting. So I'll actually know more on Thursday, um, but we can get back to you as to what the rollout of that information is. Okay, and then, um so it seems like there's been a, a lot of public involvement, which is great, and thank you for that important work. Can you, as a brand new counselor who wasn't here for the last round of discussions, could you just speak to a little bit how the plans have evolved to become more uh, bike and pedestrian safe? Have, were there major changes in the design that we can report back to the public on? Yep, so the significant change uh, on the bridge is moving from a 12-foot shared-use path on the downstream side to 15 feet of space allocated and having it striped to be um, 5, 5, and 5, so bi-directional bike striping and then a dedicated pedestrian space on that side. Okay, and final question. Are separate bike lanes, <coughs> bike and pedestrian lanes, is, is this like Councillor Kane was talking about before with the four lanes of traffic, is that totally off the table or is that something that's still under consideration, separating have, walking from biking? Yeah, uh, my apologies. We have looked at it pretty extensively because um, the public has asked for it in both communities and it's geometrically, it's not something that we probably even have the width for um, with having to create different barriers in between each spaces Having the elevated sidewalk um, without really a, a really wide sidewalk is really challenging for maintenance, um, both the safety of the sidewalk tracker, tractor operator who under the current bridge has fallen off the sidewalk and rolls their tractor sideways into traffic um, and are there until they are picked up. Wouldn't be quite as dangerous with a, with a bike facility there, um, but it is still immensely challenging. Uh, even some of the local motion group and advocates who originally requested the separated, barrier separated or vertically separated bike ped facility have rolled back after doing their own case studies of Montreal and some other northern communities, seeing that that's just not what happens. Um, and the design team lastly has hired an expert uh, and we, internally received a, a presentation um, that really outlined different communities much larger than us that have very successful bike ped facilities without barrier separation. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKnight. Are there any other councillors that wish to speak to either 9.2 or 9.3? Oh, Councillor Shannon. I just have a quick question, which is um, in the slide that shows the cross section, it looks like there there is a barrier. If that's not a barrier, what am I looking at that's one foot wide there? Yep, that's uh, the barrier between the vehicles and the bike ped space. So that is one of the things that was inside of our raised grant application is, is separation between those two modes of transportation. Uh, what's being requested is a barrier that oh, then further okay. separates the bikes and peds. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Any other councillors wish to speak on either of these items? Councillor Kane, yep. Yeah. Just one other brief question. Um, so I think you mentioned to get the 10 and a half foot lanes, we'd need a waiver. Could you just detail a little bit more of that process, the timeline, the likelihood of getting it, just what, what, what that involves? It's a pretty simple request. Uh, both communities just need to put it in writing. Um, we did request this actually when VTrans just recently refinished Main Street. Those lanes they wanted to put back as 11 feet. We pushed back, asked for 10 and a half so that we could guarantee a four foot bike lane down the street versus the three that they were attempting. Um, so it's a pretty easy process. It's just they can't ask for it themselves. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kane. 
On item 9.2, there is a two-part motion, and Councillor Barlow, could I turn to you for those two parts? Uh, sure, President Travers. I move to authorize the Director of Public Works to execute the FM0449 Standard Finance and Maintenance Agreement for Federal Aid Projects, Burlington Winooski BF Raise 2 from the Vermont Agency of Transportation for design and construction of the Winooski Bridge, with the funding split for this project being 80% federal, 10% state, 5% Burlington, and 5% Winooski, and to authorize the Chief Administrative Officer or their designee to effect all necessary budget amendments and transfers of funds to and from uh, the above referenced funding sources as needed the above referenced project expenses in FY24 and overall project budgets as further detailed in attachment two. Thank you, Councilor Barlow. Is there a second on that motion? Second from Councilor Broderick. Is there any further discussion on the motion on item 9.2? Just really briefly, sorry to double dip. Um, I'm just assuming if there's a conversation about pedestrian versus bike and separating it there, that the reason you don't go to the 10 foot on the other side is like the Riverside Ave shared path. Is that the thinking? Uh, that is the general experience that we've seen um, and heard from our outreach. We are actively counting the bridge, um, and those numbers are just preliminary coming in as tests, but we can also, we'll be able to confirm the, the balance of use on each side of the bridge soon. Thank you. Any further discussion on 9.2? We will then go to a vote. vote. All in favor of Councilor Barlow's motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. Uh, Councilor Barlow on item 9.3, there's also a two-part motion if I could turn to you for that. Uh, of course. I move to authorize the Director of Public Works to execute the FM, am I am on the right one? Yeah, I am. Um, I authorize the, I move to authorize the Director of Public Works to execute the FM 0477 Standard Finance and Maintenance Agreement for Federal Aid Projects Burlington STP 5029 from the Agency of Transportation for design and construction of the Colchester Riverside Barrett Mill intersection with a VTRANS commitment to cover 100% of eligible project costs and to authorize the Chief Administrative Officer or their designee to effect all necessary budget amendments and transfers of funds to and from the above referenced funding sources as needed to pay for the above referenced project expenses in FY24 and overall project budgets as further detailed in attachment two. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Is there a second to that motion? Second by Councillor Carpenter. Is there any further discussion on item 9.3? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. All in favor of Councillor Barlow's motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, and thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you very much. That now takes us to item 9.4. Appreciate your uh, patience, Nathan Lavery. We will have one other deliberative item after this, 9.5. Also appreciate the patience of Chief Lachance and BFFA President uh, Blake. Um, but uh, first, um, uh, uh, Nathan Lavery uh, on a resolution authorization for reimbursement from public improvement bonds for school district capital improvements for integrated arts academy. This similarly uh, comes before the council with the unanimous support of our board of finance. Uh, as uh, no doubt Mr. Lavery will discuss here momentarily. Uh, this is from a um, capital bond that was approved by voters back in 2017 and uh, felt it um, important uh, given this new council as well as the time that's gone by since then to receive a brief update from, from you on behalf of the school district as uh, with respect to the status of that bond. So the floor is yours, Mr. Lavery. Great, thanks, good evening. I'm just gonna pour myself a quick sip of water here. Okay, thanks, good evening everyone. Um, 
for those of you who were not part of the Board of Finance Committee meeting, there's a memo that is circulating um, and that I've also sent electronically, just drafted today, that provides a broader update on the status of uh, a few different funding sources that rely on city's general obligation debt and the projects. Um, so this is a, a goes beyond the item that's specifically before you all tonight. So I'll start by just touching on um, the Integrated Arts Academy reimbursement resolution. That is a resolution that will allow the school district to reimburse itself with the proceeds of the bonding for that project when that bonding takes place. The work, for those of you who've been in the area of Integrated Arts Academy, the work is already beginning there. You may have seen some of the, the equipment out on the fields, and it will really ramp up once students leave uh, for the summer. <clears throat> but we know that, and, and, and of course, as that work ramps up, we will have bills to pay. Uh, the bonding is uh, for the school district, for those of you who are new, is actually done by the city. It's the city's general obligation. And so we are content, content operating on the timeline for the city's plan to issue that debt. This resolution just ensures that we can reimburse ourselves for the costs we've incurred up and until um, we actually get the proceeds of that debt issuance. So that's really what the reimbursement resolution is about. More broadly, um, and this memo talks about it, we, uh, we have three major ways that we can access uh, city debt to support infrastructure projects. Uh, number one is an annual $2 million authorization that we can use and do use each year to make investments in our infrastructure. The city has a similar provision in the charter that uh, allows it to, to borrow money without uh, having to go to the voters every single year to ask for that authorization. Second, we have a $19 million voter authorized a capital infrastructure bonding authority that was from 2017. And that at the time was envisioned as part of a larger $39 million effort to improve school district facilities over a 10 year period. So it was the $19 million voter authorization plus 10 years worth of that $2 million that I first mentioned. So that 20 million plus the 19 is how we got to the 39 million. And then, of course, uh, many folks are familiar with the more recent $165 million authorization to support the construction of a new Burlington High School and Burlington Technical Center. Um, again, for those who, who haven't uh, passed the site recently, the demolition of all the old buildings is now complete. And while there's a little more cleanup to do, we're shifting uh, very heavily into construction mode, finally, which is, is great because um, as the weather improves, there'll be more opportunities to cruise by there and, and see things going up including um, probably some of the beginning of the structural st steel in the near future. So um, that's really exciting for us. So we've got those three funding sources, uh, and then we have a lot of projects that are going on. So the intent of this memo is try to give people a sense of what's going on and also let you understand what is what of these projects are being paid for with that debt and which projects have other funding sources that are supporting them. So the big one, obviously, is the high school and the technical center project. And that is uh, obviously the $165 million, but also some money from our $39 million, really that $19 million authorization for the, um, for the capital plan. Originally, we had uh, planned to use a portion of that uh, capital project authorization for the high school. And then based on the availability of federal money to support other work, we kind of did a little swap where we put more of our capital plan money into the high school and redirected some of the federal dollars to the Integrated Arts Academy project. That Integrated Arts Academy project has a major HVAC component to it that we can use $10 million of federal dollars um, that were part of the major COVID recovery legislation pieces, the American Rescue Plan. So we are essentially doing the IA project with a combination of $10 million of federal money, and then the additional $7 million, give or take, is coming from, uh, from our debt authorizations associated with that capital plan. When that project's complete, and when you combine it with the fact that we are using um, approximately $20 million now of that capital plan money to support the high school, 
we'll pretty much have tapped ourselves out of that authorization, depending on where final project costs come in. Um, so those are the two big pieces that city uh, tax supported debt is supporting. We also have projects going on at Rock Point right now, which is a partnership with the Episcopal Diocese there, where we are renovating space, entering into a long-term lease, and that uh, and are gonna have our On Top and Horizons programs, which are going through a rebranding effort right now, but they are going to be co-located at that location. That project does not require the use of any debt to accomplish. And then we also have an exciting project going on up at the airport right now, where we have, uh, and, and the council has uh, seen this, I believe, is we have entered into a long-term lease with the airport where we are leasing a hangar up there. We have an existing aviation program, uh, training program up there for uh, maintenance of aircraft and so forth. That, is, uh, that project is being funded primarily through a $10 million congressionally directed spending award secured by Senator Leahy, as well as some additional district funds that we have set aside to support completing that that project. So there are some really, really four major projects that the district is uh, is taking on right now. And um, and that's a lot, to be honest with you, in terms of uh, the, the amount of work that's being done, the amount of coordination, planning, and so forth. But they're all really exciting projects, and uh, we're really looking forward to, to getting students in all these new spaces. Coming back specifically to IAA, um, because I think that's important to wrap up with that, uh, the project there, for folks who aren't familiar with it, that is going to displace students for the entirety of the next school year. The project there is going beyond what I would say what is strictly necessary today to do. And the reason it's a bigger project is largely because of this need to displace students. As we set out to kind of design and look at the options for the project, we identified the fact that Displacing students is one of the most difficult things to do, both in terms of the instructional impact on students, but also from a technical perspective. We need to find space that is uh, that we're allowed to put students in. We need to associate, we need to identify um, the ability to transport them to the new spaces and so forth. So we recognize this as the opportunity to do all the work that we could on that campus that requires displacing students. We could have split this project up over, multi, kind of made it multiple projects, done a little bit now and done some later, but that would have required us in a subsequent year, at some point in the near future, to displace students again. And we felt like that was far too disruptive to try to manage and to try to put that uh, learning community through. So we opted to put all of that uh, remaining effort and the financial resources into bring IAA's campus up to where we believe it needs to be. And we also felt comfortable doing that, and the board felt comfortable doing that because all of the other schools in our district have more recently received uh, significant investments. Integrated Arts Academy was the one school that really had received very little in terms of uh, meaningful infrastructure improvements. And so, um, you know, like any governing body, the school board had to grapple with the fact that there's a trade-off inherent in investing more money in, in that school than the original capital plan had envisioned. But based on the progress we made at the other schools and, um, and the opportunity that having the swing space available to display students, that opportunity presented it, we felt like it was um, in the best both financial interest and kind of long-term um, district's financial sustainability and, and, and support for instruction to kind of make all the improvements at IAA right now that we can do. So that project would be slated to be completed at the end of next school year, and students um, would, then be, would then be able to return to that school for the following school year. All right. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, just so you know, I had also, if, if you'd not provided this already, I did send you an email asking if this could be sent to uh, the, the council's clerk for posting on our agenda. Yeah, I did send it to Lori during Great. the Great, perfect. Thank you very much for that. Um, before uh, turning to a motion, we'll turn to councillors to see if anyone would like to be heard on this item. Councillor Doherty. Uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, incredibly helpful. Um, I, I believe I'm, I'm the only member of the city council who has, uh, is the parent of, of IAA student. Um, in fact, all three of my children have attended IAA. My uh, third grader is, is there right now. 
um, want to just say two things. One, um, it's an institution that's obviously near and dear to, to my heart um, and um, have spent an incredible amount of my life in IAA and it is sorely in need uh, of these uh, capital improvements. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to see that they're happening. Uh, and I'm also really, really grateful about the thoughtfulness that, uh, that, that you folks have put into um, the impact of displacement on the elementary school students. Um, my kiddo, Malachi, will be spending his, his fourth grade year in, in the swing space, um, but I'm grateful it's only gonna be one year, uh, and so is he, and he's, he's really looking forward to returning to IAA in fifth grade. Um, and he's already, they're already enjoying all the construction uh, that's happening. So, so thank you, um, much appreciated. Yeah, right. That unanticipated benefit. <laughs> thank you, Councilor Doherty. Does any other councilor wish to be heard on this item? All right, seeing no one, I will uh, turn to Councilor McKnight. I will just um, flag for members of the council that an original version of the resolution on this uh, included a, a not insignificant clerical error um, indicating that the city has issued uh, three million dollars under a certain series of general obligation bonds when in fact that number should be 300,000. Um, so we are looking at the revised version that's posted on Civic Clerk um, and Councillor McKnight I would turn uh, to you uh, for a motion on that revised version. Thank you. So on uh, item 9.4, authorization for reimbursement from public improvement bonds for school district capital improvements for Integrated Arts Academy. I move that we waive the reading and adopt the resolution. Thank you, Councillor McKnight. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Barlow. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Nathan. Thank you. Uh, we now turn to the last item on our deliberative agenda, which is 9.5, Burlington Fire Department Community Response Team. Uh, very glad to have with us here. And, and again, as mentioned before, thank you for your patience, Chief Lachance, as well as BFFA President Kyle Blake. Good evening. It's the item you've all been waiting for, the last item. But not least. But not least. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the council. I'd like to thank Romeo and Lee for your comments. We really appreciate the support uh, from everybody that's, uh, that's been behind us through this program. Um, what we're looking for tonight is the ability to continue spending the money that was allocated for this program back in October of 2023. We were allocated $182,598 for a six month pilot um, that accounted for two people 12 hours a day, seven days a week, which we knew wasn't gonna be possible being that we were staffing it with overtime dollars. After six months, which ended yesterday on the 14th, uh, we still have $48,213.65 available to us for continuation of the, of the pilot. Uh, we're asking permission to continue this pilot through the end of the fiscal year. Um, Councilor Carpenter, I appreciate the uh, amendment to the motion at the Board of Finance last week. Um, that $48,000 will get us about two weeks shy of the end of the fiscal year. So Councilor Carpenter made a friendly amendment to our motion to allow for uh, us to work with Ms. Shad to find some funding to get us that last two weeks. And we're confident that we'll be able to do that. So um, the future of the program, we'll, we'll come see you for that for FY25. But uh, for now, we're just looking to continuing continue spending the dollars and um, get us to the end of the fiscal year I do have information if anybody has questions I'm happy to share it but it's late if we don't want to see it or I'm happy to send it to you 
Oh, thank you very much for that presentation. I know that there's data that's uh, posted uh, to our agenda as well on this item. Um, every deliberative item here I think is a Board of Finance item, and I'll mention it again that this item as well comes with the unanimous support uh, of our Board of Finance um, and would encourage folks to check out the agenda for uh, some very encouraging data uh, since the CRT has been stood up. Um, I will turn to councillors for anyone who has any comments on this matter. Councillor Grant. I'm a big fan, as you well know. Um, I appreciate the data, and uh, it is one of the reports that I had attached to the public safety updates. Um, I think it's uh, really important information because as we continue to work on community safety issues, and especially the drug crisis, uh, things have to be very data-driven. And I just love the way this came about from the ground up and the leadership around listening to your team and bringing this forward. And uh, one of the things I want people to also think about as we go in and we're looking at um, how hard the budget process is gonna be this year, this, this also saves a lot of wear and tear on the larger vehicles, which are significantly more expensive to replace so it just it, it's just hitting all the buttons it's hitting all the buttons um i also thank romeo and lee for their comments this evening uh, i think they reflect what a lot of people are feeling in the community about this thank you councilor grant before turning to you for a motion do any other councilors have comments on this item yep councilor litwin in, in the, thanks. In the same vein of trying to, to get us out on time, I'll just say I really appreciated Councillor Grant's um, comments. I completely agree with them and Lee and Romeo's uh, comments as well. Um, rarely, just from a prevention lens, rarely do we see um, this type of success so quickly. Um, and the type of relational work that goes into this that your folks are doing takes time to play out. And so six months just isn't enough time um, to, to have a successful pilot of this nature. So I will continue to support uh, this particular program and I would encourage us all to, to keep working together to do that. And thanks so much for everything that your team is doing uh, downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Grant, as chair of our Public Safety Committee, can I turn to you for a moment? Um, oh yeah, sorry, Kyle. I'd just like to add to uh, the membership of the Burlington Firefighters Association is appreciative of your continued support for this pilot, for this program. One of the key pieces of this was trying to reduce, uh, you know, Councilor Grant talked about the strain on the vehicles. There is strain on the human capital of this city as well, which are the men and women on the front lines uh, in this department that were responding to so many calls last summer and this uh this pilot program the crt is really helping to reduce the strain on the employees as well so i just wanted to highlight that i think that is very important to point out that the work they are doing is helping to reduce some of that um burnout that compassion fatigue we've talked about making sure that the the men and women on the front lines are fresh and able to respond to to the true emergencies and the CRT sort of picking up some of the, the slack, still providing that emergency service, but it is, it, it is a breath of fresh air when that truck is responding instead of an engine and an ambulance um, constantly over and over again. So thank you uh, from the membership for your continued support, allowing us to continue this into the summer, which is when um, we talked about, it, or you talked about it a little bit earlier, our call volume is going to pick up and we're just we're already at 11 percent above where we were last year uh you know we're going to see where we're at uh come august so thank you for your continued support uh councillor mcknight i wanted to echo others sentiments here and also call out um from a systems perspective you know the, your department is absolutely innovating in uh, the way that we should be moving uh, government systems forward. And uh, Mayor Mulvaney Stanek, I hope to have the chance to work with you on how we can take this model of innovation and kind of study how we arrived at 
uh, this success and implement it in other departments across the city because I think this is truly the kind of leadership and success that we need citywide and I really want to applaud you for that so thank you thank you thank you uh, Councilor Grant could I turn to you for a motion now thank you um, I would like to move to approve and authorize the chief administrative officer to make any and all necessary budget amendments to allocate the use of the assigned opioid money fund to support operating costs of the fire department community response team until funds are exhausted with a budget not to exceed the original approval of $182,598 and to further authorize the extension of the CRT pilot program through the end of the city fiscal year 24 or the end of available funding. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Is there a second to that motion? Second by Councillor Litwin. Is there any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. Uh, all in favor of the motion from Councillor Grant say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you, President Blake Thank and you. Chief LaChance. That concludes our deliberative agenda. Uh, the next item is item 10, committee reports. The standing committees of the City Council have now been posted online. I know that uh, our committees have been uh, scheduling their first organization meetings. The committee reports are an opportunity for uh, generally committee chairs to provide a brief update as to upcoming dates and times for uh, committee meetings and any discussion uh, that may be taking place there. Uh, with that in mind, are there any councillors with a committee report? Councillor Barlow and then Councillor McKnight. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, the Transportation, Energy and Utilities Committee will be meeting on Tuesday, April 23rd, 5 p.m. at 645 Pine Street. The agenda is still being created, but we will have a discussion about two of the bus routes, the College Street Shuttle and the City Loop and their fare status with GMT returning to fares next month. Um, we'll also be discussing committee priorities and possible agenda items for the coming year. Thank you, Councilor Barlow. Councilor McKnight. Thank you, President Travers. Just a brief update on the Parks, Arts, and Culture Committee meeting. Uh, our first organizing meeting has been scheduled for next Thursday, uh, April 25th at 12 p.m. here um, at City Hall in the Sharon Busher Conference Room. Uh, agenda still to be determined uh, and uh, that's I'll leave it at that thank you great are there any other counselors with committee reports Councillor Newbite Newbeezer um, <clears throat> you're the first person to get Newbeezer off the bat versus Newbeezer I'm, all right I'm very impressed well so after two you. years of everyone calling me Traverse uh, <laughs> I, 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 uh, <laughs> need to get it right <laughs> um, so just a quick update from CDNR we scheduled and I appreciate Evan and Joe we had a scheduling marathon and Christine um, but we locked down a date that's going to work uh, 5 30s monthly on the third Wednesday of the month with our first meeting on Wednesday uh, May 15th um, and then I understand that there's a FY 25 budget presentation so instead of work uh, starting at 6 30 I think I just said 5 30 starting at 6 30 monthly um, we're going to start at 7 following the budget presentation thank you are there any other counselors with committee reports Councilor Grant. Um, I mentioned the uh, Public Safety Committee meeting, which will be this Thursday. Uh, the REIB Committee will be meeting on April 30th. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Grant. As a uh, parliamentary matter, um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councilor Grant here, that your intention with the motion that you made on 9.5 was to read the full motion uh, as is listed on Civic Clerk, including uh, $10,000 contingent upon available funding or the end of available funding and without objection from the council I, I would I would uh, including yourself uh, I would consider that being the um, motion that you uh, uh, read on 9.5 that would be correct that um, additional amendment didn't make it to one of the pages and I was looking at the wrong area so I think we could all be in agreement of that okay any objection from the council all right, any further committee reports? Okay, that takes us to uh, City Council General Affairs now. This is an opportunity for if any City Council would like to speak on General Affairs, they may do so. Does any City Councilor want to speak on General Affairs? 
Councilor Broderick. Um, yeah, so the, sorry, uh, the Ward 8 MPA is meeting Thursday, April 25th at 6.30 at Sharon Busher Conference Room right underneath Contois Agenda TBD. Thank you very much, Councilor Broderick. Any other councilor on general affairs? Councilor Grant. I can't find it, but we received an email earlier today um, regarding the, uh, it, it's a meeting that uh, students and um, staff members of the University of Vermont, it's called Community and Coalition, and it talks a lot about um, the issues that are experienced by and affect off-campus students. Um, I try it when they have their meetings to listen to them, like because it's during my work time, um, and sometimes I, I participate when I can. But it's very, very interesting. And given that off-campus uh, student population from the University of Vermont, uh, it, we all know how many of them are in our um, community, and they did a survey of them. It was a pretty significant sample size, uh, about 1,200 students. At the last meeting, they started to talk about uh, food insecurity, um, insecurity, paying uh, rent, paying utilities, and uh, they're going to be going into some more details, as well as talking about the spring move-out dates that are uh, scheduled and we know last year that even though these spring move outs are really helpful to keeping the um, the streets clean there were a number of issues last year uh, there would just seem to be a higher than uh, normal complaints but we're able to give feedback to them as well thank you Councillor Grant any other yeah Councillor Newby sir Sorry, I, I know I'm extending. Um, just a reminder that May street cleaning is coming up for folks. Or one residence, we're zone E, I think. It's coming up on May 1st. Um, so just make sure your cars are off the road um, so you don't get towed. And I just appreciate uh, our first meeting together. You all are wonderful, and I'm excited to uh, see what we can do. Thanks. Thank you. Any other counselors? Yep, Councillor Litwin. One more, and I'm uh, mindful of the time as well. So um, as folks know, I just uh, joined and got my email set up and um, was traveling and unable to be here during uh, swearing in and came back to quite a few constituent concerns about um, some tree clearing that occurred in Keyslick Park. Um, and I've been in touch with um, Director Cindy White of, of uh, Parks and Rec, and um, also with uh, Abby Duke, um, and uh, Mark Barlow came and, and walked through um, with me recently, and so I definitely want to check in with you, um, Councillors Kane and Grant, because we share a, a boundary line there, and your constituents definitely use the park. Um, it, it appears there was an error um, by the construction company um, in, and it was, it's quite shocking um, to many people to see. And so they're, they're, what I understand right now is that um, a plan is being worked out with the city arborist um, and uh, some folks on Cindy's team um, for a proposed restoration plan. And I just think that that uh, plan should potentially live within a committee or at least have public input um, and public communication about that plan before it's agreed to with the um, developer who um, crossed the boundary line into the um, protected space. So Thank it's in you, Ward 7, but it's right on our ward boundary, so. Thank you, Councillor Litwin. Anyone else? All right, uh, that takes us to item 12, which is city council president updates. I just have a, a couple brief items here. One is I want to echo what Councillor Newbezer said, which is, uh, thank you all for working through this first meeting, first real meeting together. It's uh, been a, a privilege to be here and I'm looking forward to the year to come. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is that this is our first meeting we've held since the eclipse. Um, and I think um, a lot of credit is owed to uh, former Mayor Weinberger as well as you, Mayor Mulvaney Stanek, um, and, and so many city staff that uh, really had Burlington at its best on that day. Uh, we received updates as a former council from a number of folks in Burlington City Arts and uh, Business and Workforce Development as well as at the Parks Department and, and they among many others just made it 
truly a, a, a banner day here in Burlington, and so huge credit goes out to those folks. Um, two, uh, just two other uh, calendar updates. One is that um, you will soon see posted online, if, if not already, uh, annual vacancies uh, for all of the city's boards and commissions. So uh, I would stay tuned to that. It will be posted online. It would encourage councilors to uh, inform their constituents about those uh, vacancies. The, the deadline for the annual postings will be on May 15th. Um, and I've been in touch with councilors about trying to put together a nominating committee for us to hopefully hear uh, and, and decide on those appointments at our meeting on June 10th. Um, and then finally, I will just, I'll send a follow-up email on this as well. Um, but we have a number of local uh, establishments uh, with annual liquor licenses um, that uh, will be expiring at the end of April. Um, and uh, if our local control commission uh, doesn't take action on all the renewals that may be coming in between now and the end of the month. Uh, we'll have some establishments who sadly will have their liquor licenses expire between the end of the month and our next council meeting on May 6th. And so um, at the Board of Finance meeting on um, April 29th, we will be warning a meeting of our local control commission, which as you found out tonight, is the full city council. Um, we can work together to see if truly everyone needs to be there. We need seven for a quorum um, of our local control commission. The Board of Finance is four. Uh, we have no overlap with our license committee, and if all three members of the license committee can be there as well, um, that would make seven. But I just wanted to flag for folks on their calendar that on April 29th, um, on the same night as our Board of Finance, we will, we will need to warn what should be a fairly brief meeting of our local control commission to ensure that um, taps keep flowing through May 6th. So uh, that is it for my uh, city council president updates. And that brings us to the last item on our agenda, which is uh, the mayor, general affairs. And we have eight minutes before 1030, Mayor Mulvaney Stanek. Well, I take that very seriously, uh, Council Travers, after starting my city council career and ending at 2 AM. So I'm committed to helping you stick that landing. So thank you, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, I, I now see why the mayor's report is at the end of the of the, of the uh, agenda, and I, I'm going to take that seriously. But I do have a few updates, because I'm sure many of you are curious how the first two weeks have gone in the mayor's office, and there's a lot going on, and I want to make sure you are, are updated. I will start a practice of offering a written piece, because I think it's helpful for folks um, at home and reading our council, your council packet to know what's been going on. So we'll turn this in and probably do two at the next, um, the next uh, council meeting. So first, I really, truly, and generally want to appreciate the warm, um, the warm start to this, this role uh, on Organization Day two weeks ago. The energy in this room, the optimism, the opportunity of really starting a new government, um, not only in the administration, but also with the council here, was really electrifying. And I hope you feel that optimism that's really um, throughout the city right now, regardless of, of who won or not. There's, an, there's a coming together that's happening in our community. And I, I attribute that to everyone. So I hope you're feeling that. I, again, just personally want to appreciate the warm reception um, two weeks ago, almost two weeks ago. I also want to really acknowledge um, my new staff who've entered in with me on the first day uh, in office about two weeks ago. And if you haven't had a chance to meet my chief of staff, Erin Jacobson, she was sitting behind me here tonight. Uh, she's fabulous. She is serving in the chief of staff role. I've also hired Joe McGee, many of you are familiar, uh, former city councilor, and now I'm moving hopefully that position into a deputy chief of staff position to really start working on some of the bottlenecking I've heard from many department heads that was happening under the prior structure. He'll still be working on communications, but I think this new system is, I'll explain a little more in just a moment. Uh, I've retained Emma Allen as the scheduler um, and assistant in the office. She's been fabulous for cont continuity of government purposes, uh, which I've said in the past is really important. And then for a temporary uh, two-month period, Dar Darren uh, Fergeron, who was my transition director and prior to that campaign director, is helping so we can set up some community engagement systems, which more on that in, in May. Um, those, uh, the Chief of Staff, Aaron, and the Deputy Joe are going to be really looking at our department spread. There's 18 direct reports as department heads to the mayor, and holy moly, that's a lot. So we're trying to split it up in terms of a portfolio between the two of them in a two-thirds, one-third role. So I've heard good feedback from department heads already on that, and I'm happy to share that list when I 
have more time and we'll put this in writing in case you're curious about that. We're trying it on, so we'll see how it goes to just, again, help department heads get the information they need, really sort of create zones of genius or, or content expert areas um, within liaisons within our office, and again, work a little more effectively uh, with supporting our departments. I've also appreciated starting a regular meeting with your council president, because I think this relationship is one of the most important ones in terms of functioning our, our city uh, and moving it forward. So I look forward to many more meetings with Ben um, as we, we develop our relationship. I also want to just thank some staff who, uh, both inside city government but outside city government, for some additional support because uh, on a little bit of a serious note, I have received threats as the new mayor coming in. Um, the day I started walking into this building, um, the morning after, and I continue to receive those. And some of them have been unfortunately serious. I name that because this is important for uh, folks to understand what um, uh, women in office are facing, what queer folks are facing, and it's happening here in Burlington. So I particularly want to thank the U.S. Attorney's Office, the State's Attorney's Office, and the Community Justice Center, um, and also um, uh, some department heads who've been collaborating with figuring out how we create a safer environment for folks to um, uh, serve, and that extends to all of U.S. City Councilors, also to our state delegation, because I know I am not the only one, and we're working on a, a procedures and safety mechanisms, so stay tuned for more on that. Uh, I just want to also, let's see, what was I going to say next? Um, people have been curious around priorities and vision. I wanted to say two brief ones. I'm already running out of time. The first two uh, priorities out of the gate will be the budget, fiscal year 25. I'm spending a lot of quality time with this woman to my right here. Uh, and we're taking this quite seriously because throughout the campaign, I talked about the importance of a lens of affordability, transparency, and engagement with folks understanding our own city budget. We have a lot of very important information we'll be sharing soon with all of you. We'll need your partnership. It's serious work ahead. And I want to underline serious, if I can, verbally, that we're going to need to really roll up our sleeves together. Um, the, I will also be naming some budget advisors from the community tomorrow. I'm meeting with them tomorrow to, because we have such serious work ahead. I wanted to bring in some folks who are former electeds and to round out the conversation and their perspective on a high level around how do we start tackling this big issue. The uh, community safety is the second and obvious um, other big priority, and I'm only stating those two for the next three months because you have no priorities if you list 100. So those are the two clear-eyed ones I'll, I'll be focusing on. Budget is the first one out of the gate, and community sa safety is the second. You'll hear more about the community safety special assistant idea I've had for the office, um, as well as uh, the general commitment to making sure that folks are safe and feel safe in our community. And then, uh, just very briefly, because we're getting so close to 10.30, um, I want to just mention I've met with virtually all department heads at this point, which has been great, one-on-ones with those folks. We had our first full department head meeting, which I think was received well, uh, and people really showed up in a collaborative way to think about how they can offer advising to my office, um, but really I continue to be impressed by the deep dedication of our department heads. So as you develop your relationships, if you're new to council, please, um, please really understand these folks are content experts in their fields. They deserve our respect and collaboration. And um, as you get your feet under you, please feel free to reach out to my office to support their good work and their teams but, but, um, with them. And let's see, uh, for community engagement, I've been out in the community quite a bit and I've really appreciated trying to keep my door open and carving out time. As you imagine, everyone and their mother wants to meet with the new mayor and I've been trying to make sure that community members have just as much of a chance to meet with me and me going out into the community. So just two or three highlights quickly. Um, I, I attended the Iftar celebration last week at the local mosque at the, uh, by the Islamic Society of Vermont. I celebrated Eid last weekend with the Afghan Alliance of Vermont, and, and then uh, the pancake breakfast at the Sustainability Academy in the Old North End. I know uh, a few counselors were there as well. So I name that because I encourage you to come and to participate and join me at any of these events. It's a great way to show up to community uh, and make sure that we're going to the spaces uh, that these folks are already convening in. And then finally, I just want to mention to highlight going way back to the agenda, uh, pop quiz around legislative uh, issues. I, as I said um, uh, weeks ago in my former role that I just resigned two weeks about, 
uh, our, our relationship with our legislative delegation can be improved. And I really look forward, I appreciate those of you who are available to sit in on my first um, attempt to collaborate with state representatives and council and our lobbyists to start to get on the same page about where we're at for folks to be able to answer, uh, ask questions, an answer questions um, of where policy is at. I'm going to do another meeting with state senators in, in the next few days. I invite you to, we'll make it virtual again so you can participate. Uh, and then when we're through this session, most importantly, I want to debrief and understand what works, what doesn't work. I have my own opinions as a former state legislator. We have so much room to improve, and I want to collaborate with you to develop an agenda that serves this city and not be just my agenda, but our agenda, and then work in the months leading into the next session with our state delegation so we can be effective in Montpelier. So look forward to that, um, and I always welcome your feedback, so open invitation. Look at that 1030, Councillor. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for naming some of the backlash you've unfortunately been receiving. Allow me to say that, that we stand with you in rejecting that hate. Um, that brings us to the end of our meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Is there a second? Second by Councillor McKnight. Uh, all in favor of the motion to adjourn, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned at, let's say, 1030. <laughs> Thank you.